to the first speaker, who is Professor uh, uh, Sudhir Sarkar from the um, University of Oxford. So, Sudhir, the, the stage is yours. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, perfectly. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Alfredo, and uh, uh, also thanks to Andy, uh, Hector, and the other organizers who invited me. So uh, and I'm particularly pleased that you have arranged for a very worthy opponent, uh, Dominic, uh, who will speak after me, and uh, we hope to have a good discussion. So as you said, today's topic is rather fundamental. Uh, uh, it is to do with how we construct a model of the universe. And uh, on the screen, you see our current uh, consensus view of what sort of a universe we live in. Uh, it's uh, got perturbations, it's got inhomogeneity, but it is statistically isotropic uh, and uh, averaged on large scales to be defined. It is homogeneous. And of course, Oxford University is at the center of the universe, as you see. And uh, when I first came here about 40 years ago, I had the good fortune to uh, meet uh, Dennis Sharma, who uh, motivated me to take up cosmology as he did with many others. And I'm always uh, uh, reminded of something that uh, Dennis wrote uh, in a book uh, some time ago, that our first approach towards cosmology to not ask why questions, but basically descriptive uh, questions to which the answer is a description of how things are, because it is really a big problem and we have to uh, make a good start on this. Now, of course, to make a, a descriptive uh, response, one needs to have data. And this was uh, not uh, around in the, what, 100 years ago when cosmology was first formulated. But today we are fortunate that we have data and therefore we can address some of these uh, issues. So the first thing to notice in uh, doing cosmology is as uh, you know, many people have emphasized, particularly George Ellis, that it is different from the other sciences in that we can only make observations along our past light cone. We can't move somewhere else in the universe and make observations from there and check whether we are seeing the same thing. So given that we live in a fluctuating density field, which you just saw, uh, it is, uh, always going to be the case that different observers see different things and we call this cosmic variance. So in that sense, um, the cosmological principle strictly defined, which says all observers are equivalent is already broken, but this is done here uh, in our current model in a well understood and uh, calculable manner. We can calculate this variance, at least knowing the statistics of the field. And there are various circularities in the arguments, but nevertheless, we have some kind of a general understanding. Now, I can't resist showing you uh, in discussing standard cosmological model, the one that uh, held sway, at least in Europe, for 2000 years, which had us at the center of the universe. And as you know, um, the moon and the sun and all the known planets went around it. And it was a perfectly good fit to the data. I mean, you just had to introduce a, not many, two or three epicycles to account for retrograde motions. And uh, it all ended in this uh, prima mobile where the fixed stars are, which is the starry sphere. And beyond that is the uh, Empyrean paradise. Uh, this is an illustration from Dante. And uh, it is very interesting for those who don't know this, that uh, Ed Harrison has done some research on this. And he points out that Dante actually records the uh, occurrence of the cosmic microwave background because it talks about this converging rays of light outside the prima mobile ending in a ball of fire. And in fact, uh, Dante writes about it and he describes the last scattering surface of what you would call the cosmic microwave background today uh, rather well, uh, because this of course that you're seeing here in this illustration is actually a projection of the hypersphere, which we will talk about next. So it's good to know that people knew about this. So here is the hypersphere that I mentioned. We have uh, the cosmological principle telling us that the uh, metric that we choose for space time is maximally symmetric. That's the Robertson Walker uh, uh, Friedman Lemaitre space time, which I've written here uh, in using conformal time rather than usual time, so that the scale factor, which is the only dynamical variable, uh, is absorbed in this. 
and then it looks like a Minkowski metric. Uh, but in fact, the conformal time is a dangerous thing to play with. You have to know what you're doing when uh, you play with it, because uh, it, of course, has the scale factor built into it, and this can go to zero. Now, when you now project the universe, it looks just like uh, the picture from uh, Dante's book that you saw earlier. Uh, we are at the center of the universe. Uh, the microwave background surrounds us. The radial coordinate is at a redshift of 1,000. So the radial coordinate is redshift. And most of cosmology uh, observations are being done within a redshift of 1 or so, a uh, few quasars out at redshift of 5 or 6. And then there are the dark ages, and then there is the uh, last scattering surface. Beyond that, the universe is the plasma. Uh, we can't see that with light, but we might be able to see that one day with gravitational waves or neutrinos or something. But the antipodal point of this hypersphere, which is this dashed line, that is the Big Bang. And since all points on this sphere are equivalent, the Big Bang is everywhere. And that is how a unique singular point can actually fill our horizon with light as it does. Now, uh, from this metric, we can construct the uh, Riemann curvature tensor and its moments, and we can then, uh, using Einstein's uh, fantastic insight, connect this on the left-hand side to the energy momentum tensor on the right-hand side. And when this was first done, uh, people assumed them to be an ideal fluid, dust, pressureless matter. And uh, later, we realized that the early universe is dominated by radiation, but that's only a small change. It's still an ideal fluid. And of course, you have the notorious uh, cosmological constant term on the left-hand side multiplying the metric. And that just reflects the fact that this has this uh, local coordinate invariance. And by that principle, you have to uh, be allowed to write that term. It's not a matter of your choice. Uh, I think, uh, as John Ellis says of living in Switzerland, anything that is not forbidden is compulsory, right? So there you are, you have to have it. And what we learned later, uh, uh, when in the 1930s, 40s, people uh, invented field theory, is that you have another term adding to that lambda from the fluctuations in the quantum fields. And uh, that then defines a total lambda. And it is that which then in enters the Hubble equation, which this whole thing simplifies to on using this metric. So the four by four matrix uh, diagonal, which so there are 10 components, becomes just this uh, Friedman equation. And you know how to parameterize it in terms of the fractional energy densities in matter and curvature and lambda. And uh, they must obey the sum rule. And we make these observations uh, of difference between matter and lambda, which from supernovae, we measured that the curvature is close to zero from the first peak of the CMB. We make some uncertain measurement of omega matter. And from this, we infer that the universe is dominated by dark energy. And what that means is that this lambda term, which is the sum of little lambda and the contribution from the fields, miraculously somehow knows what our present day Hubble parameter is. So I'll leave you to think about that. And that scale is 10 to the minus 42 GeV. And uh, this uh, can, in principle, drive accelerated expansion, such as is claimed to be the case today. And this then is interpreted as vacuum energy at a scale which is the geometric mean of this 10 to the minus 42 GeV and the Planck scale, 1 over 8 pi Gn, and that's about uh, milli electron volt. And of course, this is the famous problem of uh, the second problem of uh, the cosmological constant, why it is so much smaller than any scale we know of in particle physics. So this doesn't make any physical sense, but this is the standard model. Now, everything relies on that sum rule, and that sum rule is based on the idea that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. This is freely admitted. So this assumption needs to be made in order to derive this uh, universe that everyone goes on about with this pie chart and everything. And there are so many instruments, you know, satellites and ground-based telescopes that have looked at this and measured things and we are doing precision cosmology. But I must say, I personally feel that little attention has been paid to testing the assumptions of this cosmological model. And in this sense, the standard cosmological model cannot be compared to the standard model of particle physics, whose assumptions have been tested down to the quantum level, radiative corrections have been measured. Uh, here, the same is not true. So where does this cosmological constant come from? Well, uh, it is usually attributed to this man, E.A. Milne, 
uh, who was in fact the civilian professor of geometry at, uh, uh, at Oxford, just down the road at Wadham College. And he said, the universe must appear to be the same to all observers wherever they are. This is the cosmological principle, right? And uh, in fact, this is discussed in the subsequent literature. Here is a paper by Littlewood from 55, who says that apart from lo local irregularities, the universe is the same general aspect at every point. And Mill used a restricted form of the principle. Uh, uh, and in fact, you can extend it further as Bondi and Gold did to be the perfect cosmological principle, which means they are not only uh, not at any special point in space, you're also not at any special point in time. Right? That was the steady state theory of the universe. Now, of course, uh, the steady state theory has been abundant because we realized we are at a special point in time. We are you know, 10 to 12 billion years after a big bang. Uh, so we don't any longer believe in the perfect cosmological principle, but the, you know, the smaller cosmological principle is still the basis of our cosmology. So why am I giving this talk? For that, the best uh, motivation I could find is from Steve Weinberg's classic textbook from which many of us learned cosmology. And he says, the real reason for our adherence to the cosmological principle is not that it is surely correct, but rather that it allows us to make use of the extremely limited data provided to cosmology by observational astronomy. If the data will not fit into this framework, we shall be able to conclude that either the cosmological principle or the principle of equivalence is wrong nothing could be more interesting. So now you see, I have the justification to give, look, do research on this and talk about it. Now, if you ask what is, we know about the universe is isotropy. Well, if you Google it, you'll be told the universe is highly isotropic and you're shown this power spectrum of this little fluctuations at the 10 to the minus five level, uh, which are statistically isotropic, we are told no non-Gaussian it is, and they're fully qualified by two-point correlation. So you can have this power spectrum that is all the information. There are some glitches here and there, but I won't discuss them in this talk. And we are also uh, aware that these small fluctuations on the CMB can grow into the observed structure of the universe today in the available time, which is a red, you know, scale factor change of a factor of thousand if there is about six times as much dark matter as ordinary matter to support the growth of the uh, uh, perturbations under gravity. Otherwise, they would be too small today. So we understand this part pretty well. Uh, we don't really know where the fluctuations come from. We have a place setter for that inflation and uh, a de -seter phase can indeed generate a roughly scale invariant spectrum of fluctuations. However, that Wikipedia statement is not quite right. The universe uh, and the sky are not isotropic. There is a huge dipole in the sky. And this was first forecast by Dennis Sharma in 67. And then Peebles and Wilkinson uh, wrote a one page paper pointing out how the temperature should vary over the sky if you are moving with respect to the frame in which the universe is truly isotropic. Let's call it the cosmic frame. Or some people call it the CMB frame. Now, these are observations. Uh, this has been measured exquisitely by Planck now, earlier by WMAP, and before that by various experiments, going back to a, a spy plane flight. And this is interpreted as due to our motion. Uh, it's one part in 10 to the 3, delta T by T. So beta is also 10 to the minus 3. It's about 370 kilometers per second. However, the Earth is actually moving in the opposite direction around the galaxy. So its velocity adds up to this 370 and the total motion is more like 620. And this is shared by the local group, by the Large Magellanic Cloud, the Andromeda Galaxy, and so on. I'll show you a picture in a second. Now, why are we moving? If the universe is exactly isotropic and homogeneous, we should not be moving. Well, that's because we say there is some local inhomogeneity, it's pulling us, but of course, uh, this is local, and if you look far enough, then it should be averaging out, and there should be the motion should die out roughly as one over r, and we should converge to the CMB frame. What is this scale? Well, it's supposed to be of order 100 megaparsecs, and people have done counts of galaxies and spheres and so on, and are supposed to have confirmed this. Now, this is Sharma's paper from 67, where he says very explicitly if the background is of cosmological origin then you should see a dipole in the microwave background, and that would have important implications for Mach's principle and so forth. And then, uh, uh, as I said, Peebles and Wilkinson wrote a short one-page paper in which they did the calculation 
which we now set to our students in special relativity, uh, how to uh, calculate the temperature in any direction if you are moving with the velocity v through a bath of black body radiation. And that observation fits it very well. Now, as I said, our velocity is a bit more complicated than that because we are moving around the sun. And of course, uh, the measurements are being taken from something at the earth. And the sun uh, is in the solar system, uh, which is in the Milky Way. The Milky Way itself is falling towards the center of the local group, as is Andromeda. We are approaching each other. And the local group, uh, then motion is defined as the 600 kilometers per second. Why is that moving? Well, there is supposed to be something which has been poetically called the great attractor, right? And here is a paper by Stewart and Sharma from 1967, which says uh, that uh, uh, we should be able to measure this dipole anisotropy as it was indeed done. Uh, I can't resist pointing out that in uh, some of our recent work was discussed in a blog and uh, we were told that we are crackpots because we are neglecting the motion of the solar system. Now, uh, the statement that we are crackpots may well be true, but it is not true that we are neglecting the motion of the solar system. We are very much aware of it, as you will see. Okay. Now, there was a prophetic paper written in 1984. I uh, ask you to observe that it was written at the Orthodox Academy of Crete in Kolembari in Crete, where there is a nice conference center that many of us have been to. And George Ellis and John Baldwin, who is a radio astronomer from the Cavendish Lab uh, in Cambridge, met there and they pointed out that if this interpretation is correct, then you should see a similar anisotropy in any distant population of sources. And they also highlighted what would happen if the two things did not agree. If the standards of rest determined by the microwave background radiation and the number counts were to be in serious disagreement, one would have to abandon either the idea that the sources are at cosmological distance, okay, or the interpretation of the CMB as relic radiation, or the standard Friedman Robertson Walker models themselves. So you can see this is really a low hanging fruit. It's a test that demands to be done once you have data. Now, this is easier said than done because our neighborhood in the universe is not really like that model I showed you earlier. This is a reconstruction of our local neighborhood by the group uh, of Brent Tully and collaborators. And they have spent many years, decades, in fact, reconstructing our local density and velocity field. We are part of this Lanakia supercluster, and we are at the center of this picture. Virgo is what I showed you earlier. We are moving towards the Shapley supercluster. This is at roughly 170 megaparsecs. So this is the uh, structure within about 200 megaparsecs. And we have to take account of this in making cosmological measurements because we don't live in an ideal universe. So this results in this bulk flow or peculiar flow, which we have to map out. What's the theory of that? Very simple. Uh, you just look at uh, the perturbed uh, uh, equations governed by continuity, Euler's equation, and the Poisson equation that tells you how density perturbations evolve under gravity. And uh, we, of course, are interested in the growing mode solution and uh, observe that the direction of the velocity and the acceleration will be in the same direction. There is no curl in the problem. So you just integrate this to get the peculiar velocity field. This is just Newton's law. We are not doing any GR here. This is on small enough scales that Newton's laws are perfectly good. And we can work out this peculiar velocity, which is just the trace of the uh, shear tensor. And uh, this thing requires a little bit of technical expertise because you have to use a particular filter, a window function in any observation. For example, you might have a volume limited survey, in which case it's a theta function. And we like to work in Fourier coordinates. So the standard thing is to Fourier transform it. And then that window function looks like this classic one sine x minus integral of sine y by y. And uh, we can then calculate what is the fluctuation expected in, say, the Hubble constant because we live in a fluctuating density field. So you tell me what your power spectrum of matter fluctuations are, and I can integrate that to work out this delta h. And for example, it says that at 100 megaparsec distance, the fluctuations in the Hubble constant uh, uh, are, are, are only of order 1% if it is a Gaussian density field, as is assumed here. right? We can similarly ask what is the peculiar velocity that you'd expect? And it says, well, at 100 megaparsecs, uh, it should be of order, uh, what is it, 200 kilometers per second. 
but by the time we get to 300 megaparsecs, it should be below 100 kilobits per second. And it doesn't really matter what power spectrum we use because this kernel here averages over the whole, uh, you know, it gets contributions from all uh, uh, wave vectors. So therefore, even if I put a spike in the density spec fluctuation spectrum, it's washed out, right? This is a robust statement, this. This is a prediction of the standard lambda CDM model of structure formation. Now, does this match the data? Well, we first took a look at the data nine years ago uh, using the union compilation of about 600 supernovae. And what we did was tomography. We take slices in redshift and we asked for each slice whether the supernovae are at the distance uh, that you'd expect if the universe is isotropic or they're brighter or less bright. So that corresponds to the size of these points and their color coding. Okay. I'm going through this rather rapidly, but the slides will be are already online. And I want to leave obviously time for Dominic to challenge me on all this. So we do this to get the peculiar flow. And we discovered that in fact, there is a peculiar flow in roughly the same direction as the CMB dipole. Uh, the direction moves a little bit according to which redshift slice you look at, but it's roughly in the same direction. And the p-value for isotropy uh, is, you know, it's down to about three sigma. We are rejecting isotropy at three sigma at uh, local scales. Hardly surprising. You saw what the density field looked like. But then you go to large scales, the universe starts looking isotropic. Also, we run out of data. That's really the problem. We have no data uh, at, at these redshifts. So when we plot this, this dipole from the supernovae, velocity dipole from the supernovae is this big patch here. Uh, and uh, this little dot here is the CMB dipole. They're in the roughly the same direction, as you can see in different redshift slices. And what this means is that we can extract the velocity, the bulk flow as a function of the redshift. And this is the expectation from Lambda CDM. And this is what we measured. It's uh, around 250 kilometers per second. It's not showing any signs of falling off. But then look at the error bars, they're huge because the sample is small and you have been honest about how we calculate the error bars. So we cannot actually exclude lambda CDM with any confidence here, right? And people, other people have of course also measured before us such bulk flows and this has been a continuing issue. But what is clear is that we have gone to, you know, to 300 megaparsecs and we still have not converged to the CMB frame. The velocity has not fallen off. And this was confirmed by the nearby supernova factory survey uh, led by Saul Perlmutter. They also see a dipole in the supernovae. This is the bulk flow velocity, very similar to ours. But of course, when they go out very far, then it starts dying out. They're also doing tomography exactly as we did. And uh, they point out that Shapely cannot be the source of our motion because the bulk flow continues beyond Shapely. And in fact, uh, if you ask how, what mass we need at that distance to pull us at this velocity, that mass is of course increasing as we go out further and further. And already it is up to about 10 to the 17 solar masses, which is the mass of Lanakia. It's the mass of our super cluster. Nobody has seen this object out there that is meant to be pulling us, but this is the data, okay? And very recently, the six degree field galaxy redshift survey has made a measurement of the bulk flow uh, with using 11,000 peculiar velocity measurements. Of course, to do this, you need independent distance measurements. And what they use is elliptical galaxies. And there is a empirical correlation between the brightness and the size of the thing. And that's called the fundamental plane. And that's good to about 15%. And that's how they make this measurement. And these are the, this is the expectation from the Lambda CDM model for uh, what the, how the velocity field should fall off. And here is the data point. So we are beginning to now see significant tension between what you observe and what we expect. And uh, we can ask uh, how likely is this if you really live in a Lambda CDM universe? And the answer is if you interrogate the dark sky simulations, we find that less than 1% of observers like us should experience a bulk flow as large as we see. So we are most definitely not Copernican observers. We are very, very unlikely observers to be seeing such a large bulk flow in a fluctuating density field. This is a point that I think has not got through to the cosmology community. We are always using typical observers to model various things, to make projections, to create expectations. This is telling us that we are not typical observers. Now, how can that have an effect? Well, there are various ideas. Here is an idea due to Christos Sagas, uh, who is a radivist. 
And he points out that if we are in a bulk flow, uh, and uh, therefore we are so-called tilted observers, we are not Copernican observers, then if you are observing objects which are also within the bulk flow, then if there is a peculiar velocity with some divergence, then if you do a covariant calculation, if you, for example, ask what sort of a deceleration parameter for distant objects uh, would be measured, for, as this observer uh, O would measure, then it turns out that in addition to what is normally measured, there is a correction that has to do with this bulk flow because we are, as I said, not uh, typical observers. And that correction is of opposite sign. So in principle, you can get a negative deceleration parameter even when the real of deceleration parameter for the global space time is positive. So you might think that you are in an accelerating universe. Okay. Now, this test can be done using supernovae. I'll go very quickly through this. You know that this has been going on for the last 20 years. These are supposed to be standard candles. You make observations in different bands and the light curves uh, vary according to uh, you know, uh, what you're observing. Uh, these are type 1a thermonuclear, but even so, they are not standard candles. But you can make them standard candles by using an empirical correlation that you observe uh, between the width of the light curve and the peak magnitude. Uh, that's the Phillips relation. And using that, you can standardize them. And therefore, people measure the peak magnitude up here. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, quote you this stretch correction, which is required to make everything fall on top of each other. And this is different according to the band you're observing. So that's a color correction. And people publish these things. So you have to use a template. So this is the spectral adaptive light curve template version two, which is uh, in use. No doubt soon there'll be a version three. But this data has been made public. And now those of us who are not supernova astronomers can use that data to try to relate uh, these uh, magnitudes uh, to the uh, redshift via the standard relationships for the FRW universe uh, using the uh, quantities I've defined earlier. Or we can do cosmography. Cosmography means you don't care about the dynamical model. You just expand the scale factor in a Taylor series. The first derivative is the Hubble parameter. The next derivative is the uh, what used to be called the deceleration parameter. Uh, we might call it the acceleration parameter now. The third one is for some reason called the jerk and so on. Obviously, this expansion breaks down as you go to high redshift, but it seems to work pretty well up to the redshifts of all the supernovae that have been observed so far, which is uh, all within redshift of about 1.2 or 3. Now, this is the uh, largest publicly available data set with everything specified, covariance matrices, the lot publicly. These guys did the community a big favor by making it public for the first time in 2014. Uh, it's made out of four different sets of supernovae, but they have nearby uh, SDSS, SNLS, and Hubble Space Telescope, but they've all been uniformly treated. Here is the sky map, and uh, you can see that uh, we don't have full sky coverage, but uh, what was more uh, concerning to us is that the statistical analysis that was being done was, in our view, not principled, because what they were doing was calculating the chi-square between the observed magnitude and the model value in a lambda CDM universe, and then adjusting an error bar that they add to each point till they get a chi-square of one per degree of freedom for the fit. So this is a perfectly okay thing to do if you are trying to estimate the parameter values. It is not an okay thing to do if you don't know that the model parameter is the, you know, the model is the right model, okay? So we decided we'd use a maximum likelihood estimator. And uh, I'll skip rapidly through this. You know what a like maximum likelihood is, is the probability of the data given a model. We can factorize into something that depends on cosmology, something that depends on supernovae. And Yeppe Nielsen, my master student at the time, pointed out that all the observed corrections look like Gaussians. So we can integrate all these likelihoods because we know how to integrate Gaussians. We can calculate everything analytically in you know few lines of code. And you can uh, therefore do everything in a transparent way and construct this famous bananas on omega lambda versus omega matter, except that our banana is touching the line that separates acceleration from no acceleration. Whereas previously people thought it was way up there. And so we say that the evidence for acceleration is pretty weak. It's 2.8 sigma. 
Uh, we show it in this plane, not because I believe in this model, but just for comparison. But a lot of people took the opportunity to tell us that actually we should be sitting on this diagonal line because of the CMB. Of course, that constraint only applies to the Lambda CDM model. It doesn't apply more broadly. And I think we knew that, but you know, it's wonderful that people educate you, uh, you know, when you, they think that you don't know the basics. However, a more pertinent criticism that Rubin and Hayden made of our work is that we assume these corrections that are made to the light curves don't have any dependence on redshift. And they point out that you could see a possible dependence on the redshift if you are prepared to add 12 parameters to the 10 parameter model we had. Uh, we don't think that's actually allowed according to information criteria. But if you do that, indeed, uh, this banana that we had down here is going to be lifted a little bit. Not much, it only goes up to 3.7 sigma. It's still not a discovery. Now, this is the sky distribution of the supernovae, as I said, and we realized that they also had had their peculiar velocities corrected to the cosmic microwave background frame in a complicated way, which uh, my collaborator, uh, Mohammed Ramiz, was about to, about uh, enable to uh, undo. And then we realized that the peculiar velocity corrections that have been made are unphysical. They stop dead at a redshift here, about 0 0.06, as if we have reached convergence to the CMB there. But I just showed you the evidence earlier that we have not reached convergence to the CMB. So what we did was we undid all these corrections and got the original data in the heliocentric frame. And when we did that, then if you allow the inferred acceleration to have a angular dependence on the sky, we find that it's actually a dipole. And the dipole is 50 times bigger than the monopole. This scale is much compressed compared to this scale. And that monopole is consistent with zero at just 1.4 sigma. Basically, the acceleration that we see on the sky when the data is analyzed in the heliocentric frame, as measured, is in fact a, a dipole with a significance of you know, 3.9 sigma. The standard lambda CDM model is excluded at more than four sigma. Now, this suggests that what Sagas is saying is, in fact, likely to be true. Cosmic acceleration is just an artifact because uh, we are located in the bulk flow. We have not taken account of that. And it is not due to lambda. So those of you who are worried about uh, you know, landscape and swampland can stop worrying. We are not uh, in any one of those. Okay. And this is the dipole in the supernovae, which is in the same direction. Uh, of course, we don't have enough data to actually determine the direction, but it is consistent uh, with the CMB direction. Okay. And a similar anisotropy has been found, as you know, by Miggas et al. Uh, in the uh, distribution of X-ray clusters, which are also like standard candles. This is the luminosity distribution. And uh, the redshift distribution is very similar to the supernovae that we have looked at. And they also see a dipole, not in the same direction, but not far off. Okay. So there is an increasing body of uh, emerging evidence that the universe is anisotropic at that scale. But Rubin and Heitloff say that what we did is wrong because they say we have not allowed for redshift dependence of the light curve parameters. We have shockingly used heliocentric redshifts. So the question is, is the CMB frame the correct frame? They, what they do is the following. They recover our result, which is this pink line that you see here, okay, which is a large dipole and no monopole. Then they go from that to uh, a, the CMB frame, which means you go to this blue patch, which just reverses the sign of the dipole, as I said, but still does not have, uh, has a significant dipole. Then you make corrections for peculiar velocities to come down to the origin. So to get from the observed anisotropic acceleration to the uh, you know, uh, desired isotropic acceleration, you have to do all these corrections. I don't know if many people are aware of this. And moreover, to do this, you have to be sure that the correct frame of reference is the frame and is the CMB is isotropic. And that is what I'll address in my remaining two minutes. So we are back now to Ellis and Baldwin, who said that if you are moving with respect to uh, the CMB, then we should also see distant sources aberrated on the sky, as Bradley, who was also a professor of geometry at Oxford, pointed out uh, some centuries ago, a relativistic effect, which he actually was used to determine the velocity of light by Bradley. He got it right to 10%. 
And this aberration must be now coupled with the fact that if you're looking at, say, a power law distribution of sources, not a black body distribution, but a power law, then because of the Doppler shift, you are sampling a different part of the distribution when the, uh, since the photons are uh, blue shifted as, they, as you are moving towards it. And we have to allow for that. So if you allow for both these effects, you have a standard special statistic formula, which I hope Dominic will discuss in more detail. So I'll just skip through it. It just depends on the velocity, the spectral distribution of the sources and the number distribution of the sources. So what we really want for this test is an all-sky catalog, ideally at high redshift. And we want to measure this kinematic dipole. But of course, there is always a poison noise. There's a random dipole. And there could also be a clustering dipole because there might be an accidentally sources close to us, which uh, you know, make us think there's a huge dipole in the sky, but it's not cosmological. So we have done this test with the NVSS plus SAMS radio surveys with uh, 600,000 sources which does not have a clustering dipole. That's the redshift of one, but we don't really know the redshifts uh, because they're just point objects on the sky. We did this test with about 1.2 million galaxies from the WISE Explorer, but these were relatively nearby. So the clustering redshift was significant. And now we have done it with the WISE Explorer. We picked out one and a half million quasars and they are at high redshift. The clustering dipole we can estimate is at most of order 1%. And this work has been done with Nathan Sacrest, who uh, is an astronomer at the uh, Washington Naval Observatory, Mohammed Ramiz, who is now at the Tata Institute in uh, Bombay, uh, Sebastian von Hausiger, who did his PhD at NBI and is now in Oxford, and Roya Mohai and Jacques Collin, who are at the Institute for Astrophysics in Paris. And uh, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll uh, very quickly mention that there are uh, two estimators that are commonly used for the dipole. The simplest one is you pick a direction, it defines two hemispheres, you count how many in the forward hemisphere, how many in the back hemisphere, and you turn your direction, do the count again, do it 100,000 times, and you trace out the dipole on the sky. However, as Dominic pointed out, uh, this uh, method has got a lot of bias. He might discuss that, so I'll skip that. Uh, in fact, he and his student, uh, Rubat, who wrote his thesis on this, uh, also discussed in detail a quadratic estimator, which is almost unbiased uh, and uh, much cleaner. Uh, the statistical error is very close to you know, Poisson fluctuations alone. Uh, this, however, is computationally much more uh, challenging. So uh, when you're dealing with increasing numbers of sources, uh, you will have to bring in the heavy firepower if you want to use that on millions of sources. So very quickly, this was what we did with this uh, sky survey, the NVSS survey, which has got this flux distribution. And then we match it to the Sydney University Molonglo survey, which is the southern sky. So then you have a full sky survey and they are at different frequencies. So you have to shift one with respect to the other to get them to match. We managed to get them to match within one person by doing a frequency shift. And uh, we removed the galactic plane, we removed the supergalactic plane because you can get artificial local dipoles from that. Actually, it makes no difference. And we have put some threshold cut and we remove nearby sources. And you know, uh, we find that there is a dipole and the dipole follows the expected uh, uh, curve on the sky. Uh, you can see it pictorially here. And it's in the same direction as the CMB within 10 degrees, but it is a lot faster, okay? And this was first pointed out by Ashok Singhal, a radio astronomer in India. But you know he wasn't using a full sky. There was a possibility of contamination by the clustering dipole. And all this was pointed out by these people. We addressed all these concerns, but we still see it. And I let Dominic discuss that. So I have only one minute to discuss our actual result, which is the new uh, catalog we have constructed from the WISE uh, satellite. Uh, which mapped the sky, and this is in this infrared. And we look at, uh, uh, you know, there are like 700 million objects, but we cut on the spectrum. We want uh, sources which have the spectrum of quasars. So we make a cut between the 3.4 and the 4.6 micron to pick those out. And then we do a threshold cut, both lower and upper threshold, to make sure that we have uh, no contamination from things which are nearby or other objects and we mask out the central plane of the galaxy. And even after doing all that, we have one and a half million objects. 
and we know their redshift distribution because a little patch here was covered by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, DR16, and in that stripe, 82, uh, EBOS, which is a bary baryonic acoustic oscillation survey, measured redshifts, and we have 10,000 redshifts for our quasars, and their distribution is this, and you can see they're all at high redshift. In fact, we can categorically say that 99% of our sample is at redshift more than 0.1, uh, above which the cluster dipole is negligible. And we do this by cross-correlating with the two-mass satellite uh, that came before WISE. The XSC is the strong source catalog. So with this catalog, we can do the same test and we do a frequentist test. This is the expectation for what we should see for the dipole if the CMB hypothesis is correct, that it is kinematical. What we actually observe is out here, it's in the tail, as you can see, and the probability for this happening by chance uh, Sebastian ran simulations. He runs a hundred thousand simulations. Only one out of hundred thousand gives you an amplitude as big as this, and in that direction. The direction is close to the CMB. It's not quite the same, uh, but it is. You know, the p-value for this being the same is actually uh, reasonable, whereas the p-value for the amplitude is excluded at one part in ten to the five. That's four point four sigma. That's even stronger than what we said in the archive preprint we put out where we said 3.9. And this is because uh, this new result is based on reducing the galactic mass to 25 degrees from 30. Uh, our referee is in fact telling us we have been too conservative. So let me come to my summary. Uh, the tilted universe uh, uh, terminology comes from George Ellis. We see a dipole in the recession velocities of uh, the host galaxies of supernovae. We infer there is a bulk flow which stretches out beyond the scale at which the universe supposedly becomes homogeneous, around 100 megaparsecs. We come to a more important conclusion that the Hubble expansion rate uh, is supposed to be accelerating uniformly. But in fact, we find that this is strongly directional. There is a dipole in Q0, which is aligned with the bulk flow and the monopole basically has uh, 1.4 sigma significance. So there is no foundation for claiming it's a cosmological constant in the vacuum. The rest frame in which distant quasars are isotropic is not the same as the rest frame of the CMB at a confidence level of 10 to the minus five in P, 4.4 sigma. We are hoping to improve it further and reach the magic five sigma. What could all this be due to? Well. Uh, in accordance with the philosophy of Dennis Sharma and Newton, uh, this seminar series is Newton. Newton said, hypothesis non fingo. But I have to mention that uh, uh, Jim Gunn back in 88 did actually give a nice talk in a conference uh, as wondering whether there could be very large scale uh, perturbations, which are isocurvature perturbations that might give you something like this. And Mike Turner wrote a nice paper based on that idea. And this has been discussed later by many people. My point simply is that the standard assumptions of isotropy and homogeneity are questionable. And of course, we have a lot of data coming. We'll have definitive tests. But meanwhile, this is already telling us that the supposition that we should do everything in this magic CMB frame to which you can simply boost by a special relativistic transformation locally that is suspect because uh, otherwise, you would not be finding this mismatch between the rest frame of quasars and the rest frame of the CMB. Thank you. Thank you, Zubi. Very nice talk. I'm sorry, a little over time. No, no, no. Uh, questions? Uh, Sergey, please uh, speak up. I. Uh... <clears throat> Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I have a technical question about the number of four, four point something sigma. Yes. Does it include the look elsewhere correction? Uh, because uh, you, in, I could not find in your paper, how do you calculate this? Uh, this is uh, not a look elsewhere correction because it's a really frequentist test. We know what we are looking for. We are what? trying to falsify or test the hypothesis that there is a rest frame in which the CMB looks isotropic. That is, uh, we can reach it by making a special relativistic transformation of 360 kilometers a second, right? So we do the same transformation 
and then we can ask what is the dipole oops that we should see in the cmb and that is in fact uh, what i showed you earlier if i can get back to my yes so according to that the dipole you should see in the quasars should be here okay with this distribution because we have only one and a half million objects what we are actually seeing is here so the p value tells you how often we would see something like this by chance when the true value is here it's a purely frequentist test and there is no look elsewhere we know where to look because we are testing a very clearly articulated hypothesis which is that the dipole in the cmb is due to our motion with respect to the cosmic frame at a certain velocity of order 10 to the minus 3 it's very straightforward but do, do you do you include somewhere the angle between your dipole, dipole and the cmb dipole that's right so as i said our angle is consistent with the cmb dipole and uh, within with the p value that this is a fluctuation of the cmb dipole is uh, much larger than 10 to the minus 5 is a few percent so it is might well be consistent but what we actually do is when we run this 100000 simulations we ask how many of them are actually within the same cone as it happens there is only one of this 100000 which has this amplitude and it happens to be within the cone okay if you run a million simulations uh, which will uh, unfortunately uh, sebastian's laptop will not support that then we might find that there are there is maybe another one which is pointing in a different direction uh, and which has the same amplitude right but the p value will never uh, increase above this that's what we can tell you it might drop below i have a question please yeah this is consideration uh, will affect uh, in certain degree the uh, estimation of the local have constant at risk have done or how is it well i showed you what our uh, local uh, 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 region looks like and i also showed you two things so first of all i showed you that according to the lambda cdm <coughs> model not reality but according to the model so this is what our universe actually looks like locally up to 200 megaparsecs okay the measurement of the hubble constant is based on first of all calibrating by parallax measurements as you know right which are now done by gaia earlier it was hibarkos and then you calibrate them with cfeed variables right and there is a long argument about what kind of cfeed to use then there's the distance ladder you calibrate you have a distance to the large magellanic cloud distance to andromeda and so on and then reset all match that up with the distance ladder from the supernovae okay they use a bigger catalog than we have i showed you we use jla they have the pantheon catalog and now they have added others to which there are additional supernovae from pan stars about 1300 supernovae and they do this matching and then they claim that uh, they have uh, taken account i mean i've i've shown you that in the standard cosmological model the variation in the hubble parameter should be no more than 1% on those scales right but remember this is the model thing this is not the reality okay so i think uh, let me consider my answer carefully i think that there might be a little disconnect between the theoretical model that we believe describes the universe and the reality and these distinction is particularly important when it comes to making measurements in our local neighborhood we really should be taking account because we live in an universe like this of in what direction we are looking nobody asks you what direction you're looking you know no observations ever in fact uh, we have to look uh, into the databases to find out in what directions the original supernovae were the one that led to the nobel prize for acceleration they are not even given in the paper secondly the position of the observer matters where are you in this density field are you sitting in a low density a high density you know that matters right and then of course along your past light cone there could be an averaging effect due to all the inhomogeneities right now all these things are typically calculated in a mock simulation the simulation can only be done assuming a model and the model that is adopted is typically lambda cdm so to the extent that lambda cdm is the true reality your simulations and your estimates are going to be correct but if the reality is more complicated than lambda cdm then you might be misled by your estimates so that's where i'll stop okay thank you 
There are many raised hand. Uh, I'll try to go in order. So first I saw the one by Ruth Durer. Uh, please speak up. Thank you. Hi, Zubir. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Hi, thank you. My question is, I have the impression, tell me whether I'm right or wrong, that the dipole which you have seen in your new paper with these quasars is actually quite similar in amplitude and direction to the one which you published of the radio galaxies. That's correct. If that is the case. Why can you not, assuming that these are the completely different objects, which I'm not sure whether that's the case, couldn't you then just like multiply the p-values and get something with the significance which is more than five sigma? Okay, so let me show this uh, nice plot from the Miggas et al. paper, which shows, uh, sorry, this is, uh, they showed a similar plot. We have made one in which you show the directions of many dipoles, which have been found in the sky. The most important is this gray star, which is the CMB dipole, the best known in direction, very precisely identified. And here you see the dipoles which are seen in the uh, bulk flow. This is fine detail that crosses uh, our paper from the Union 2 catalog. And this is the supernova, nearby supernova factory. Uh, the star is a dipole that we found in the Wise galaxies. The triangle is the smack bulk flow. This is the bulk flow model that is typically used by cosmologists to account for our local uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, the bulk flow. And this uh, upside down green triangle, you can barely see, uh, that is uh, another updated uh, model, right? And Miggas et al, the X-ray clusters bulk flow is down here. Now, as you can see, each of these things actually has an uncertainty of order 10, 15 degrees. If you knew, uh, to answer your question very precisely, if you are sure that all of these are high redshift objects, then what you say is true. We can combine them and we can therefore increase our statistics. The problem is that for the X-ray clusters, this is the redshift distribution. They're mainly local, half of them are local and then a tail going out to redshift of 0.5 or so. For the supernovae, we had something very similar. This is uh, the redshift distribution of the supernovae. Half of them are local, this big spike. And then there is a tail going out to redshift of about point, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.81, only a dozen from the Hubble Space Telescope. So these are quite different in redshift distribution from the quasars, which is for the first time we have a distribution of objects, which is definitely at high redshift. For the NVSS sources, we are only guessing that there are high redshifts because they are quasi stellar objects. They're point like objects, they look like stars. They must be at high redshift. People always think that, but we don't really know because nobody has measured them. And even for these, we don't have redshifts for all the one and a half million. We have them only for a subset of 10,000, right? But we have shown that this stripe SDSS uh, stripe 82, it's at a random position in our sky, right? And we have uh, checked that it is not biased in any way. And within that, uh, the redshift distribution is this. So what I'm asking you to accept is that this can be taken as a proxy for the entire population, right? Now, if we could do the same thing for NVSS or any other radio source catalog, then we can indeed do what you're suggesting and improve, increase our statistics. But I think Dominic is waiting to tell us now that with the square kilometer array, they are preparing to do uh, something even more uh, ambitious than that, where they might have even bigger statistics and that would be uh, the way to go. For now, I think we will concentrate on increasing our quasar sample. In fact, we have another quasar sample, uh, not from CatWise, but from the Gaia Unwise catalog. And uh, we are working on that. It has this uh, definitely a, a high redshift distribution. Uh, but there are uh, issues in combining the two catalogs. You'd rather present that as a separate result because it's like, you know, it's like Atlas and CMS. These are two different experiments. We don't need to combine them. If each of them can independently give you something that is approaching five sigma, then I think you are more likely to believe it. Thanks. Uh, was that was that what you wanted, Ruth? Yes, roughly. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Sergey. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the talk. That was very interesting. 
So I, I have some maybe simple questions. So you say that even in your clean catalog, actually very nice you have this slide now. So yes. In the clean catalog, you have like 1%, possible 1% contamination of nearby sources. But uh, the level of the dipole is also at the same level. It's about 1%. So how, yeah, how do these two things match? And maybe a related well, question. You can, you can divide 1% uh, of a million is, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, 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 10,000, right? And uh, if one and a half million gives you a dipole of 10 to the minus three, then 1% of that will be 10 to the minus five. So there is no way that that could give you a dipole of that order unless you line them all up in one direction. Uh -huh. Okay. See, now, so when I say that 1% uh, 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 are at, could be at low redshift, the estimate of the clustering dipole we make is based on the expectation in lambda CDM. To estimate the clustering dipole, of course, you have to have a model of clustering, right? Mm -hmm. And the well-defined model that we do have is lambda CDM. It's a, a very precise theory of structure formation. So you can calculate everything in it. And mm -hmm. when we calculate that, we find not unexpectedly, because in lambda CDM, the universe is meant to become homogeneous when averaged on scales more than a few hundred megaparsecs, that if you go to a redshift of one, obviously there is no clustering there. So there cannot be any clustering dipole, right? Mm -hmm. But we are yeah. playing safe. And what we are saying is that, uh, uh, you know, there could be a, a, a tiny tail of that one and a half million quasars, which are uh, nearby, and uh, that could give you a clustering dipole, but that clustering dipole is completely negligible compared to what we are seeing. Yeah, and another question is how well you keep uh, under control the systematics of uh, which can be due to scanning strategies or things like that. And also yeah. you mentioned that you combine the two data sets. So no, we have not program. combined two data sets. Uh, we are in fact uh, doing the Gaia unwise uh, thing completely separately. As regard to scanning strategy, that is an important point. And in fact, uh, I had an interesting question from Will Sutherland, a cosmologist uh, at Queen Mary, and he was concerned uh, also about temperature effects because this satellite is actually on a polar orbit around the Earth. It is not at, uh, at, at L2 like uh, you know, Planck was. So you have to worry about uh, differential heating of the satellite and so on. And uh, uh, Nathan, our collaborator, uh, has established how the temperature varied the point is that you're scanning the sky many, many times and things average out. So we are satisfied the temperature is not an issue. The scanning strategy does leave, uh, does not survey all parts of the sky uniformly. Our flux cut is precisely to uh, avoid patches where there might have been less exposure, which can give you a false dipole. And of course we do various systematics checks, the most important of which is just look at the surface density of sources in the catalog and ask if they're consistent with what you expect for the distribution. And we find that indeed it's a beautiful Gaussian down to a level of 10 to the minus three, which is what we need to uh, be able to see a departure of one part in 10 to the three. Mm -hmm. I have not shown uh, the distribution here, but we have done all those checks. Yeah, and about two data sets, I probably misunderstood, but at some point you had a slide where you showed that there is a Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Uh, oh, that was like. for the, no, that was, a, uh, sorry, that was, I'm sorry yeah. if that was confusing. That was a notional thing. It just says that if I pick any direction in the sky, that means there is a Northern part and the Southern part, but I am allowed to turn that to any direction. And I, this is just- No, counting. yeah, no, this I understand. No, actually another slide, like two slides uh, further, oh. you have blue and uh, pink, yeah, here. Oh, yes, yes. This was, okay, very good question. This is because these observations were made from the Earth, where the telescope is uh, obviously rooted to the ground, and mm -hmm. the NVSS is done from the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico. They cannot change their latitude. That's why you have to go to Molonglo in Australia to get the southern sky, and the two have to be then matched together. And of course, there is an overlapping part. We have to make sure that the counts are the same in the overlapping part, otherwise you can't uh, combine them together. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, that's why we apply a common threshold cut and you have to match them taking account of the different frequencies. But this is irrelevant when you go up in a satellite, then you have no Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. Just which different is why, data set. Completely yeah, different exactly. data set. Yeah, completely different data set. Yeah. But uh, I think Dominic will discuss in more detail the issues with uh, radio sources, which are obviously have to be done from the ground including by the square kilometer array to come. So some of these considerations will be important there. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks. So I'll take the last question before moving to the next talk. Yes. Uh, so there is a raised hand by Prabhakar Tivari. Hi, Prabhakar. Hi, Sameer. <clears throat> yeah, so I want to ask, uh, first of all, like, implement on the Red Seed thing that uh, you mentioned that we got Red Seed for some small patch. We can do, uh, it, it has already been done for like VLA, we can also have Sensor and Hercules and then say about 10 milli Yes. We have all the sources, so something similar like the Redshift profile, like the template is also known for the uh, VLA and VSS. Yes. So that's point one. And the point two is like the masking effect. So yes. you have partial sky and you are trying to extract the full sky dipole from this uh, partial sky. So then uh, the issue is like, if you are just fitting the dipole, then the magnitude uh, may be a very different. Like. Uh, the famous black and wallpaper, they tried to fit uh, dipole, quadrupole, and octopole. They fit up to at least three multiples. Yes. And this work, I only see uh, dipole. Uh, yes. So I think the dipole magnitude could be somewhat different. I mean, in other words, you can say there is leakage to higher multiples, uh, like the nearby multiples, basically quadrupole and octopole. Uh, because you have partial sky and the dipole is pointing in some direction. So, so okay, I, I've understood your question. So the issue that you raise is one that is uh, well known because it enters, of course, into uh, analysis of the CMB. And I think I can see various CMB experts connected to this talk, uh, where again, you have to do the same thing. You have to put a mask over the galaxy and you have to worry about the coverage effects and the bias that it introduces in extraction, especially of the lower multiples. And you're quite right that when you look at the cut sky, as everyone knows, the multiples are no longer a set of orthogonal functions. So there will be a, a, a crosstalk between them. There is a covariance matrix that describes it. And that is why when the CMB people uh, present a power spectrum, they're careful to call it a pseudo CL rather than a real CL. And that of course is something that is well known to possibly affect the determination uh, of the low multiples in the CMB. I'm trying to go back to uh, the picture I had of, yes, here is the slide of the CMB. So you see, well, they call it temperature fluctuations, but when it's shown as a power spectrum, it's actually not the real uh, CLs, those are pseudo CLs. Now, uh, having learned from the experience of the CMB people, we are very aware of the issues you're talking about. And I think we should take the discussion offline because it'll take me uh, much longer than I now have to answer that question but I just want to make an emphatic statement. We do not believe that our dipole is strongly biased by the masking that we use because we have taken the opportunity to vary the mask and see how the dipole magnitude changes. And actually that was in a hidden slide, which I did not show earlier, uh, which is in fact here. We have altered the mask all the way from 30 down to 10. We can see that it's perfectly safe to use the mask uh, for angles more than 20. We are now playing with the mask where you just block the center of the galaxy and have a narrower strip along the Milky Way. Uh, in fact, the referee asked us to do that. And that gives us uh, closer to about 1.8, 1.9 million quasars. So our significance goes up even more. And we do not find that there is any likelihood of this amplitude being, uh, uh, it is not so much the amplitude. The question is always with what p-value are you rejecting the null hypothesis? And the null hypothesis is the standard kinematic interpretation of the CMB dipole. So I believe that what we have is pretty robust. Uh, that is why uh, I'm saying here 4.4 sigma in the uh, preprint we put out, we only said 3.9 but the final version will present these updated results. So uh, I, I take on board what you have said, we are aware of it. And indeed uh, that is a general concern with any sky where you put a mask, you have to worry about the bias that it induces in your extraction of quantities, uh, which are typically assumed to be orthogonal, but are not on a cut sky. Thank you. Thanks. So there are other uh, questions, uh, but uh, uh, I suggest to move to the, to the next uh, speaker and then uh, uh, I would respond to these uh, questions to the, to, the, to, the, to the end of the session. So thanks, Ubir, for the super nice uh, presentation. And um, so please stop sharing uh, your screen. Okay, I'll do that then.
Thank you. Thank you. So now the next speaker is Professor Dominique Schwartz from uh, the Bielefeld University, and they will tell us a constructive criticism about uh, this test of the cosmological principle. Enjoy. Hi, thanks a lot. Thanks. It's a pleasure to um, comment uh, on, on Subia's um, new results. And it's also an opportunity to show you some of our own new results, which perfectly match what Subia is saying. Um, uh, so I have to put this. This is not full screen, right? Yes, it works. OK. Um, Good. So let me also start quite at the beginning. Um, so we talk about precision cosmology, and that also means we need to precisely define what we mean by the cosmological principle. So Supia has already touched upon these different versions of the cosmological principle, and let me just reformulate some of them in a bit more mathematical way. Um, the strongest cosmological principle that was ever proposed was the version by Bondi and Gold, which is called the perfect cosmological principle. And it says that the universe is a maximally symmetric space time in not only with respect to space, but also with respect to time. And it's obviously ruled out. But interestingly enough, this is as a first approximation, this is what we call cosmological inflation. Uh, it's a De Sitter space time, right? Um, then, of course, Einstein's version of the cosmological principle was uh, what I would call the exact cosmological principle, where, he, you, where you just make the statement about homogeneity and isotropy of the spatial part of the universe, not of the time component. Um, and as we also already mentioned, strictly speaking, this is ruled out because there is structure in the, in the universe, right? Um, so what, what do the typically cosmology lectures or textbooks do, they use a kind of a rather vague form of a cosmological principle, I would call it, uh, which goes in the following, it says something like, on large enough scales, the universe is spatially homogeneous and isotropic. But if you think about it carefully, this is not a principle, because it does not make any prediction. Because whenever you don't find isotropy and homogeneity, you say, okay, my scale was not large enough. Uh, and, and I just have to go to a larger scale, right? Uh, so, so this is not a version of the cosmological principle that we can really test. So what I think what we can test is what I would like to call the statistical cosmological principle. And I would formulate it in the following way, say um, the statistical distribution of light and matter in the universe, especially homogeneous and isotropic, um, because we can't anyhow probe other things besides light and matter. And um, we only probe the distribution of those things, right? Um, and if you then calculate ensemble expectations values for those distributions, then you return to the exact cosmological principle by Einstein. But you can still allow for structure, of course. Um, nevertheless, this version is typically not used in textbooks because it's, it makes it much more complicated to derive on the next page the friedman robertson walker metric. Because you would have to first define which are the metrics or which on which Riemann manifolds can you define a statistically isotropic and homogeneous distribution. And I think this is a question that is actually not solved uh, in, in, in mathematics, whether, when, whether, whether it's actually known, it, it's not clear to me if we know all Romanian manifolds that allow us to define an isotropic and homogeneous statistics on it. Uh, and I would not be surprised if other manifolds besides metrics that are described by uh, friedman lemaitre models would also fall under that uh, domain. OK, but I think nevertheless, we don't have to know what is the mathematical precise description of that. Um, we, it makes a clear statement about observables in this way, and, and we can test it in that way. Um, 
so then what, what is the direct consequence of the cosmological principle? And, and I think one that is extremely important is that if there is no cosmological principle, there is no such a thing as a co-moving observer because the cosmological principle defines uh, what is the common time that all co-moving observers are using. Um, and, and without the cosmological principle, we would have free falling observers, but we would not have co-moving observers with the Hubble flow, right? Um, and, and so, uh, and then once you have said, okay, there are co-moving observers, then it's clear there is one frame that is preferred. It's the frame of the co-moving observers and uh, other observers which can also be free falling are not necessarily also co-moving, right? Um, and uh, so the, the choice um, that we typically make is that we assign that co-moving frame with the CMB frame. But the question that we have to ask is, is that the correct assignment? Yeah. So even before we start to make a test of the cosmological principle, we have to ask ourselves, um, what is the frame in which we want to test it? Yeah. And so let me um, say a few words about the CMB dipole before I turn to the um, meta dipole. Um, so as, as Subi pointed out, uh, uh, it was predicted there should, that there should be a kinematic uh, aspect in the CMB dipole. Um, and I think it's clear that there is a kinematic aspect in the CMB dipole, but can we really associate 100% of the CMB dipole with the proper motion of the solar system? Or is there other aspects as well? And so the first thing that um, is striking, if you look at the measurements for the CMB monopole, the 2.7 Kelvin and the CMB dipole, the 3.3 millikelvin, and you look at the precision of the measurements, then the interesting thing is that since the last Planck release, we know the dipole better than we know the monopole. The fractional accuracy of the dipole measurement is, exceeds the one of the monopole. Um, and then you could ask, okay, so maybe this is something that we should really try to understand because it's an, it's an excellent measurement that we have, right? Um, and in principle, if you think about it, of course, there's, it's clear there can be uh, our motion, but there can also be primary effects because why should not the last scattering surface have a slight temperature variation from one side to the other? Why is, I mean, there should be a, a, a gravitational gradient. So the standard sachs wolf effect that you also assign to the quadrupole and octopole and so on should also be there for the dipole. So there should be a, a primary CMB dipole as well. And there could also be secondary effects like an ISW effect, like lensing and so on. Um, so what you can do is you can just take your CAMP or class code or whatever, and just uh, put the best fit Planck parameters in it and calculate what is the predicted value for the primordial CMB dipole. And when I did the last time, I found that the band power of the best fit model was something like 33 microkelvin squared. Um, so if you convert that into the same unit as the amplitude of the CMB dipole, this is uh, 0.05 millikelvin. And you see this is a factor 50 larger than the measurement error on the CMB dipole. So in principle, our precision to measure the CMB dipole is good enough to also measure fluctuations in the CMB dipole, even if you just follow the standard picture, right? Not, not questioning anything else, but um, so to that extent, we, are, we could say we are pretty sure that what we see in the dipole is not exclusively the motion of the solar system, but there must be also something. So even within the standard model, without questioning anything, the CMB dipole definitely should contain aspects that are not due to the motion of the solar system. Um, so, but of course, um, yeah, and, and I, I tried to draw it here, yeah. Okay, so, but then the question is, how could we, could we make an independent measurement of what's the velocity of the solar system with respect to the rest of the universe? 
So this is the same as saying, who is the co-moving observer? Um, and uh, one attempt on, on trying to find the co-moving observer was done by the Planck collaboration themselves by using all the um, small hot and cold spots um, and using the aberration of them and the, uh, the same and, and, and Doppler boosting of those spots, um, which creates a, mode, mode, uh, a neighboring mode coupling. And then one can try to, to measure the velocity from that. Uh, but that measurement is not as precise as the direct dipole measurement. And it agrees with the direct dipole measurement with a relatively large error bar. Uh, but the error bar is so large that it, it would allow to change the inferred velocity by something like 40%. Uh, without creating a conflict uh, within the Planck data. So then, of course, um, okay, 40% is quite a lot for something that we call precision cosmology. So we would like to know our velocity maybe a bit better than, than uh, up to 40%. So what we could do is we could use supernovae or maybe uh, standard candles, or we could also use standard rulers, uh, or we could use standard sirens in the future uh, at some point. Uh, and and Zubia uh, talked on some aspects on that. I'm not going to go into this detail because uh, I just have 20 minutes and uh, I just want to focus on the other aspects. So, and the, and the third idea is you can, um, use the meta distribution uh, following the ideas of Alice and Baldwin. Um, and uh, Subia promised that I will explain you that formula, but I did not plan to do that. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I can try to do it. <laughs> so um, it's clear there's two effects. There's the aberration effect. So, so the idea is you count sources on the sky. Um, you count uh, the, how many objects do I see in a pixel on the, of the sky and how many objects do I see in another pixel of the sky. And then you ask yourself, um, assume you start with a completely perfectly isotropic uh, distribution of sources and then uh, and you are sitting at rest and then you start to move. And then you ask yourself, how, how does the sky change due to my motion? And then there, as Subia pointed out, there are two effects. One is the aberration that you just learn in your, your special relativity class. Um, and that is responsible for the factor two in this formula. Uh, you can understand the factor two because we have two uh, angles, right? It's a two-dimensional effect. That's why the, the factor of two. And the second term in that uh, square bracket comes from the boost uh, of the of the spectrum. So typically, now you have to now you have to assume something, or you have to know something about what is the um, spectral energy distribution of the light that you see. And in the simplest cases, that all the sources are identical. And they just follow. Uh, they just have a, a spectrum that is a power law, and that has a, that, that power law has a spectral index that is minus alpha. Uh, so this is the factor one plus alpha. And then there is also a dependence on how many objects do you see, depending on how sensitive is your telescope. Um, and uh, X is the exponent on how does the number of sources depend on the sensitivity of your telescope. So you would say the number of sources, uh, if you go uh, deeper in, in density, increases like one over uh, your flux to the power X or so. And, and these are the, the unknowns in this formula. So X is the spectral, is, is the, is the flux distribution, alpha is the spectral distribution, v is the velocity, and z is the speed of light. Um, and that's, of course, just the leading term. In principle, there is an infinite series of terms. Um, but since we assume that v is much smaller than c, you can go with the linear term. Um, and what you're looking for is a dipolar feature on the sky. And therefore, you need 
uh, by definition, large chi fractions. Uh, you cannot do it with dedicated deep surveys. Uh, and, and most surveys in astronomy are small field and deep. Very, very few surveys in astronomy are really wide field and deep. And you need both here because you need to overcome just Poissonian shot noise. Uh, therefore, you need, need large numbers. And you need to have large fractions of sky. And these are very challenging uh, measurements because in principle, as, as, uh, so if you just take the um, CMB uh, veloc inferred velocity and, and make a forecast, then typically you find you are looking for a per mil to maybe yeah, five per mil effect or something like this. Um, and so that means you have to control your photometry to know the flux. You have to control your systematics uh, like extinction, if you are in optical galaxies, uh, foregrounds, if you are uh, in some other wave bands where the Milky Way is very bright, um, the seeing, if you uh, observe from ground, um, beam shapes, uh, all kinds of things, all, all that what, what observers have to deal with every day. And you have to control that, all of those things to this per mil level, and you have to control it over a long time scale because typically you then don't scan the sky in one day. You just uh, do a part of the sky on one day. You do another part of the sky on another day, and you have to con you have to make sure that all your uh, systematics are stable over the whole duration of your of your uh, campaign, so to say. And I think that that is the main challenge in all of, all of those things. Um, yeah, so we did a forecast for the SKA uh, to see how hard or easy will it be to measure these, uh, this cosmic radio dipole with, with an SKA survey. And what you see here is, uh, so what we did is we made simulations of uh, a universe that, has not, that is not isotropic, but also has local structures in it. Um, such that you have a structure dipole, plus you have a kinematic dipole. And what you can see here is that um, if you just take the cosmic structure, an isotropic universe has a structure in it and nobody moves, right? Uh, this is this, uh, can you see my pointer? No, I can't see it. Um, this is this pink color. This dots are, as you expect, scattered out, out all over the place, right? Now you start to move in that universe, then you should see the purple, uh, then, then it's the purple bot, uh, dots that you would see. Um, and you see they start to cluster more around the CMB dipole direction. And then what we also simulated is what if, so, so this, this is a simulation, if we just take all the SKA sources that there are. Um, and now, if we also know the redshift of all the sources, or at least of all local sources, and we are able to exclude all the local sources, then you can reconstruct the red dots. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see how well you can, what, what types of amplitudes for the dipole you predict. So the purple ones uh, is what you predict um, with the structure. So you see something of order 1% in total. And um, so this is just the standard lambda Coltac meta model, right? And uh, you can assume that this type of forecast is of course, would look a little bit different if you do it for these vice quasars. It would probably not be exactly the same because they would have a slightly different redshift distribution than the redshift distribution we have assumed here for SKA sources. Um, but the principle, I think, would be very similar. And so um, what we did recently is we revisited all wide area radio surveys. Um, and we noted they are nicely spreading out over a decade in radio frequencies. 
Um, so the, the top figure is the DGSS survey, which is about 150 megahertz frequency, and it was done with the GMRT in India. Um, the second uh, row is the VEN survey, which was done with the Westerbork telescope, and is at 325 megahertz. The uh, third row is the Molonglo uh, SAM survey, in done from Australia at 840 megahertz. And the last row is the NVSS done with the VLA in New Mexico at 1.4 gigahertz. So you see these four surveys are four, four different instruments, four different frequencies, four different observing teams. So it's quite unlikely that they have any instrumental or methodological systematics that are uh, too much correlated with each other. And um, so what we do with these surveys is then, so what you see here, the, 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 the plots show you the uh, number densities basically, or, or number source count densities. Um, then we mask them, uh, you mask out the galaxy, um, and we do some flux cuts uh, to um, kind of throw away the, the most noisy part of the data set and so on. And then we measure the amplitudes of the dipole, we measure the monopole and we fit the dipole. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is, if you look here, I express everything in right ascension and declination, um, and I uh, converted the result that Zubir showed you just before for the cutwise quasars also in right ascension and declination. And you see uh, right ascension declination within the error bars, all these four radio surveys and the cutwise quasar catalog, they tell you there is a dipole in the same direction. Uh, it's roughly 140 degrees in right ascension and something like minus five, minus, yeah, around minus five degrees or so in, in uh, declination. Um, that's not exactly the same direction as the CMB dipole, but it's close to it. Uh, it's about between 10 and 20 degrees off. But you have also seen this on, on Subir's uh, plot. But then if you look at the dipole amplitude, you find a very interesting thing. Namely, the lower you go in frequency, the higher the amplitude becomes. Um, and we noticed already a few years back, and, and I think uh, many others also noticed this, that this dipole in the DGSS has a much, much larger amplitude. And it was thought that probably the DGSS is just too noisy or, or the, the, the flux calibration maybe is not good enough to trust it and so on. Uh, and maybe we should not trust that result too much. But on the other hand, if you look also on the VENS and SUMS data, which are much smaller catalogs, have much less uh, area of sky, but they fit into this trend. Um, and we also did an analysis where we just analyzed those data that are common in uh, those sources that are the same in the DGSS and in the NVSS. So we cross-matched them and found indeed that if you just use the cross-matched DGSS sources, you find the same result. If you just use the cross mesh NVSS sources, you find the same result. And if you use the, the kind of cross correlation between them, then you just find their average. So this is all very consistent. And it's also completely consistent with what uh, Subia and colleagues found for the cutwise quasars. So you, ask, you might ask yourself, okay, is that a, a chance, uh, an accident? No, it should not because radio sources, these radio sources that are in these catalogs are typically all AGNs and quasars are also AGNs. So uh, we are probing just active galactic nuclei, which are typically uh, situated at high redshifts. And uh, it's true that we don't know the uh, redshift distribution of all these radio service very well. Um, but this will improve in the next years. Sorry, Dominic, uh, there was a raised hand by Prabhakar. So yeah. if you have a question, please uh, speak up. Yeah, I want to point out that NVSS and Catwise has a very good match. I mean, the direction and the amplitude. 
all goes very well. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I would say, for, so the first conclusion from that is that what, what Subri and colleagues find is completely consistent with what the radio sky tells, tells you, right? Um, I mean, Subi also showed you the combination of NVSS and SOMS, uh, where they rescaled kind of the different frequencies. But I think it's better to use them separately and just to use them also as a probe of slightly different aspects of the radio sky. Um, so look, looking at the different frequencies, then also tells you something extra, namely it tells you extra that if this would be just kinemat if this would be just an effect of proper motion, it should be frequency independent. Uh, so it tells you that whatever we see there is not exclusively a very different uh, rest frame of the universe. Um, it could well be that there is also a a rest frame, a, a, a kinetic kinematic component in that uh, signal. But I think it tells you, or it tells us that there is some structure that we are seeing um, that we have not understood and that is not in our standard model. Um, so, but before trying to, to ask, ourselves what could that structure be and, and, and so on. Maybe it, we should still ask ourselves what could be wrong in, in that analysis. And um, I mean, one aspect that comes to my mind when, when looking at this WISE analysis is that um, WISE sees, of course, not only AGNs, WISE sees also star forming galaxies and sees, of course, also stars and so on. and this AGN star forming galaxy separation is a very tricky issue. Um, I'm also involved in LOFA and in LOFA we do, uh, we try to cross match all our radio sources with vice sources and with optical uh, redshift uh, campaigns. And we have realized that it depends strongly on which types of classification schemes and which types of uh, software packages you use, uh, whether you classify something as an AGN or as a star forming galaxy. And uh, so if you so so if you are interested in, in, in statements that have to be accurate at as an order of magnitude, I guess, then you would get things wrong uh, right. But here we are talking about uh, 1% or even smaller effect. And so that means you should try to make sure that your AGN star forming galaxy separation that is necessary to estimate your photometric redshifts. Um, this must be also precise to that level. And that is very challenging. And this is not, I mean, Subia showed you that they did quite a nice thing by cross matching this with SDSS and EBOS. Uh, which is certainly a very nice uh, um, feature that you could use there. Um, and, um, but, but I, th I think much more deeper studies on that aspect will be needed for all the radio surveys um, to, to, uh, to really be clear what is the redshift distribution of the sources. Uh, because it could well be that maybe we see something like uh, a great wall very close by or a big void very close by, which is even harder to, to really uh, pin down. Um, and these, these local big voids or big uh, walls can also create uh, sizable effects and they might not be in the generic lambda contact meta prediction. Um, so, so something that is coming up in the next years is with, with LOFA, we are going currently to um, survey the complete northern sky. 
we have already released 400 square degrees. We are going to release next year 5,000 square degrees. Um, and that will be about 4 million radio sources. And all of them will come with photometric redshifts. And uh, so that will, this will not be the best probe for the dipole yet because uh, 5,000 square degrees is still a bit small for, for really getting a good uh, dipole measurement. But at some point uh, when we will have the complete Northern hemisphere and in the Southern hemisphere, the EMU project in, with, with the ASCAP will also have the full Southern hemisphere eventually. Um, and, and LOTS and EMU together um, should even in the pre-SKA era um, allow us to, so in the next four or five years, allow us to uh, test all of that uh, to much higher precision. So let me then conclude. Um, so I think that this observed meta dipole is real and that it's not dominated by our proper motion. Um, so then if this is a meta dipole and it's obviously large, much larger than predicted, uh, there could be two reasons why it's so large. Either it could be large because it's a rather small nearby, but really strong anisotropy. Um, so something of order one on the 100 megaparsec scale, or it must be something of the order of 1% on the 1000 megaparsec scale. But both things are kind of not predicted by lambda coltac meta model. Uh, and, and I think therefore, either way how this goes, uh, this is an interesting and uh, observation and I, I, I think it's a, it's a topic we should uh, try to invest more in. And I think what is very important is that we tell our observational colleagues that wide area surveys are important to understand these things. And it's not always good to just drill deep. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Dominic, nice talk. So questions? Prabhaka, do you have another question? We talk about different frequencies like SAMS, TGSS, VLA. So all of these, I mean like surveys are at different frequencies. But once you put some cut, like what you were really chance to cut, then the sources are exactly the same. We are having exactly the same catalog. I mean like about uh, the I mean, it's a point source catalog and we have positions and uh, like in TGSS and SAMS and VLA, once you have a flux cut, we are having exactly the same object in our catalog and doing cosmology or calculating dipole is no difference. No, that's not quite true. We, we don't see exactly the same sources. Not uh, going to like play any role there. No, no, but the sources, there is a variation in spectral index of the different sources. It's, it's not that all the sources have the same spectral index. So um, if, you, if you do a flux cut, so, so what we did is we compared uh, different flux cuts that correspond to a spectral slope of uh, 0.75. Uh, so so we, 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 uh, we used the flux cut in 150 millichansky in TGSS and 15 millichansky in NVSS, for instance, right? Uh, which would, if, if all the sources would have the same spectral slope, then we would see exactly the same sources. But it's not true. There is not a one-to-one -one match of all the sources. So, uh, and, and that can also then explain why you see you see slightly different sources. So you see slightly different populations in the different frequencies. And that's that's why you can see different amplitudes. I mean, but you, uh, when we are doing a dipole, then it's, I mean, I have checked this effect, then this is like, it's going to be averaged out. Like if you, if you consider like a 1% fluctuation in spectral index or like even higher fluctuation in spectral index, 
but when you really do the dipole, it's not uh, a big effect. No, no, but the fluctuation in the spectral index is not 1%. We have objects that have spectral indices of minus three, and we have ones that have a uh, flat spectral index, right? Uh, yes, so that's, I mean, that could be high, but uh, still, yeah. I mean, the number density fluctuation is not uh, that high. I mean, like, if you if you take, like, the TGSs and the NVSs, then above some flux, the sources are going to match, and then you are going to have, like, a few percent of sources uh, kind of, like, mismatch. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is true. I mean, like, the frequency is different, but then the question is, is this some real effect are the systematics. I mean, it's not very clean. It's not, we cannot be very sure that th is this really some uh, like physical effect or just because of systematics. Because uh, it's, I mean, when you talk about the spectral index and these things, then it's about a uh, lot of astrophysics is there. So it's not that clean cosmology. Can I make a comment, please? Uh, so first of all, Provaker, uh, Ramiz has actually replied this. Even if you are seeing the same sources, uh, if we determine from independent catalogs that they are distributed anisotropically, isn't that interesting in its own right? <laughs> okay, that I think one should keep that. And secondly, I wanted to say something about TGSs. I think we all know because you guys have all studied this. That's the most uncertain uh, in terms of systematics and you know coverage and so, and in fact that is reflected in the plot Dominic showed the dipole that you get from that as the largest error bar, and this uh, apparent tendency for the dipole magnitude to change with frequency is dominated by the TGSs and its cross correlation. If you take that guy out, the rest of the data is completely consistent with the frequency independent dipole. And therefore, I think uh, we really have to focus on, as you said, if, if it is kinematic, it of course has to be frequency independent. And therefore, I think it is important to uh, establish uh, whether uh, TGSS is actually pointing to a frequency dependent dipole or not. Uh, my personal view at this point is that I'm not convinced it is uh, because I know the, in fact, that survey was done from the, GMRT telescope in Pune in India, I know very well the people who did it and the problems that they faced in uh, you know, addressing some of the issues you raised. Uh, I would not trust the dipole from that as much as I do from NBSS. Yeah. No, no, sure, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's fine. But nevertheless, I mean, um, that they show the same directions that's true. Non-trivial, right? That, that, that is true. I, mean, I agree. Yeah. It's it's non-trivial to mess up an observation in a way that you <laughs> keep the direction the right the right one. Yeah. But you just mess up the amplitude. No, I agree. In fact, single Ashok single uh, also has looked at the quasars. Uh, uh, we don't think he did it as well as he did the NVSS catalog earlier, and he gets a direction which is the opposite of what I quoted. Right. <laughs> I mean, you can get. Uh, differing answers, uh, you have to be very careful in this game, I agree. Uh, but to come back to the essential point you made, which is that, uh, uh, you know, I think we agree that the observed matter dipole is not, uh, you know, fully kinematic. Uh, and whatever is the reason for that, I tend to believe that it cannot be a local uh, 100 megaparsec scale thing. Well, sorry, I should not make that too strong a statement because I don't think we have mapped out our local neighborhood as well as we should. I mean, the work that I showed by Brent Tully and collaborators, that's the state of the art and there is still a lot to be done there. These mm -hmm. measurements are very difficult, as you know, because you need independent distance measurements, which are uh, rare as gold in cosmology. Uh, you know, everybody, uh, distance measurements are often circular. They're not independent. And uh, my point is that uh, regardless of what the source of this is, the important takeaway message for me is that this definitely shows that we cannot just assume that we can make this uh, 360 kilometer second transform to the CMB frame and say that, uh, you know, if, if I might show my screen again for a second, that the very important implication for me, which I take rather personally, is that we are told that when we see a dipole on the sky in terms of the uh, inferred acceleration of the universe, 
which is definitely a dipole uh, in the observations made in the heliocentric frame from where we are. And then uh, people criticize us by saying, no, 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 you have to go to the CMB frame and correct for peculiar velocities. And then you will get from this uh, anisotropic acceleration to an isotropic one, okay? And you have to do these steps in order to do that. And these people in their own paper, Rubin and Heitluf, uh, in a paper that is, uh, you know, I, I hear in Quantum mag Magazine that they're supposed to have shown that what you have done is wrong. I invite you to notice that what they are saying is that they actually recover our result. And then they say that in order to get to quote the right result, an isotropic acceleration, we have to do all these corrections. And these depend crucially on assuming that the CMB frame is the cosmic rest frame, right? And I'm saying that I hope uh, at least we now can consider whether that is really the case or not. And therefore, uh, this argument, uh, which is uh, supposed to be refuting the anisotropic acceleration of supernovae should be reconsidered and it should not be accepted that they have shown that uh, this is just a uh, consequence of our not working in the correct frame. It's not clear to me what is the correct frame anymore. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, we should we should figure out what is the correct uh, frame of the universe. I mean, yes. the rest frame of matter. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, you could imagine that the quasar frame is the correct frame. And the CMB dipole looks smaller because you know there is some super horizon isocurvature perturbation that happens to just give a cancellation, and you know people have considered these possibilities, but that of course raises its own issues. You know, but there is obviously a fine tuning then involved. You know, why should that have happened and so forth? I think we are just at the beginning of trying to get to grips with this. But the first thing is to accept that what we are told in the textbooks, every textbook. Uh, you know, uh, with the exception of the health warning in Steve Weinberg's textbook, that, that we need to now look at that with data. And uh, this is something that I'm, you know, very, uh, feel very strongly about that uh, when we have a, a standard model, we, to call something a standard model, we should go and look at the fundamental assumptions of the model and check them with data. And this has not been done, in my opinion, for cosmology as much as it has been done in particle physics. And I don't understand, therefore, why people are so opposed to doing it, because actually these tests, as we have just discussed, are not that complicated. They are very transparent, they are very uh, immediate, and the impact is considerable. So I don't understand why more cosmologists don't want to do this work rather than you know, make forecasts for... Uh, you know, how well you're going to measure the equation of state of dark energy or whatever. I mean, you can't find in any of the uh, uh, manuals for all these surveys that are coming up, uh, any discussion of this, with the exception, I agree, in SK, in the science book, I think because of you and others, Dominic, there is a, a, a there is an emphasis placed on tests of the cosmological principle. But in most uh, of these missions, I don't find any mention. Yeah, but it's one should also say it's very hard to keep this to to, to keep this to be in, in in the whole consortium right that people stay aware that this is one of our main targets <laughs> yes because they, they are so fantastically interested in calculating uh feature matrices and things like this and and forecasting exercises on exactly. some parameters yeah exactly exactly this is fetish yeah that we are seeing uh, that, that but, people go for forecasting exercises well that's the point this is this is the disease i would call it of so called precision cosmology what we want is accurate cosmology we want to get the right model first before you measure its parameters to you know n places of decimals that's just, we have seen in the history of science that that is not the right thing to do. You have to first determine if it is the right model. Mm -hmm. uh, like we should probably, like this is a very contextual statement, right? Because one can say in what context are you asking this question? Now, if you ask for CMB observations, people have tested for statistical isotropy and all of these tests have been rigorously gone through. Now, this is a new measurable and you're trying to ask the same question 
I'm not even sure whether this is a question of isotropy or homogeneity. For me, I think of more, think of this being as a locally inhomogeneous universe. That is what we are probing here. And so I, I think it is very important to separate the context, no? It's not hardly local. We are talking about objects at redshift of, of, of typically of one. So it's not local. And you're right that in the CMB, there has been much more attention paid to testing statistical isotropy. Uh, in, and in particular, there is, uh, as you know, there is a, a three and a half sigma indication for a hemispherical anisotropy. There is a similar indication for a scale dependent modulation of the primordial fluctuations, which in fact we established using the BIPOSH formalism uh, that Tarun and others uh, uh, and Amir Hajian uh, came up with. Uh, there is evidence that there is a scale dependent uh, uh, anisotropy a quadrupolar modulation in the fluctuations. Uh, so in the CMB, these tests are relatively easier to do. Uh, uh, and however, cosmic variance is a limiting factor. And I think that in order to proceed further, you cannot do that with current data. Even with Planck, People have looked for the aberration effect in the CMB. I think this has not been discussed so far, so let me mention that. They have a paper very nicely titled, A Pursi Move. It's supposed to have established the kinematic origin of the uh, CMB dipole. Unfortunately, it has not, because uh, it, the detection was two to three sigma. Okay, And you can tell that from the size of the dipole they infer. And similarly, they have gone on to a Epursi Move 2, where they're now using the thermal sunai zeldovich effect. Unfortunately, in the CMB, you have the problem that you have to be sure you're seeing the CMB and not some galactic foreground. And uh, in the past, uh, we have gone wrong with that, uh, you know, the famous bicep saga for one. And when you are getting down to this kind of level, so measuring some effect, which is one in a thousand of one part in 10 to the five, then it is really challenging. And you really have to understand whether your foreground subtraction is accurate to that level. So I, I agree with you that in general, the CMB, the, the mathematical formalism is very elegant and people have done beautiful work on devising various tests and they are being done. But currently I think, uh, you know, the data that we have in the CMB so far is not adequate to settle the matter. We have to go to new missions. We cannot do it with the current data. No, but we'll probably all agree with that. What we are probing over here is the dipole in the local large scale structure distribution, right? It's not local. This is at redshift greater than one. The yeah. local large scale uh, uh, structure we have already probed with the wise galaxies, which are far more numerous. And they are uh, dominated at redshift of around you know, 0.15 to 0.2 or so, you will have a large contribution. But therefore, there is a large clustering dipole there. Now, what we found was that the clustering dipole was anomalously large. It is much larger than you expect in lambda CDN. But it is still relatively local. So then we can argue about how typical or untypical our environment is. But if you go to redshift of one, then there's no talk about local. It is about what the cosmic frame is as defined by matter. And there, there is no ambiguity. Now, the CMB is, of course, not a redshift of one. It's a redshift of thousand. So even better. We know exactly what the cosmology was when the CMB decoupled. It was exactly Einstein Jupiter universe, and you know small fluctuations. We can measure them with far more precision. But I'm saying that this aberration effect in the CMB, which one might hope to detect to uh, definitively decide the issue of whether the CMB dipole is of kinematic origin, that measurement, even with Planck, is not good enough. It's not uh, better than three sigma. And uh, unfortunately, I don't. I know people have been uh, trying to improve on that. Uh, uh, well, for example, Shubhadi Mukherjee and others have been doing that, Ben Wandelt and so on. And they haven't been able to push it further than what I just said. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, uh, we just realized that we have a sort of uh, time cut off due okay. to the meeting of our Zoom meeting at uh, six o'clock. We are yes. not sure about what will happen, but for the moment, let's uh, keep discussing. Okay, and uh, but you might suddenly all disappear into hyperspace. Yes. Maybe in that okay. case, uh, I apologize, but let's see. No, what no, no, no. Happens. Seem to be I, have a, uh, I have a question, please. Uh, so please. The, the, the question referred to. Uh, the, the instrument you used to, to detect this anisotropy. What happens if you observe, uh, if the precision permit in the future, 
if you observe the universe with the gravitational waves and not with the uh, light, uh, that will create some some new possibility because uh, uh, it is supposed to be also a background of gravitational waves. And perhaps that background do not have the same restraint that the CMB. And uh, then uh, uh, if, if that is not so, then uh, Small and isotropies will appear in the CMB because of also of the background of the gravitational wave. Uh, is it? Uh, is it? Uh, can you comment on that, please? Well, of uh, please. Uh, the you 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 have to connect your microphone to so it. What we have detected you so have far. Microphone. Yeah, I've just unmuted myself. What you have detected so far, uh, of course, as you know, is gravitational waves from individual sources. And obviously, as we detect more and more sources, uh, not just a handful, not just hundreds or thousands, or, but you know, millions, uh, then you will indeed have a, a hopefully, uh, you know, you have a large population. But uh, you are, I don't think you're going to be able to detect gravitational waves from sources at a redshift of one. They're just too faint. Uh, to be detected. The other thing that is cosmological is, of course, any relic gravitational background from the early universe, right? Uh, now that essentially, as you know, currently the upper bound on that is already at the level of uh, uh, something like uh, 0.2 uh, microkelvin, right? The CMB fluctuations are about 60, 70 microkelvin. The upper bound from bicep on the B mode, etc., that's already at the level of R of less than 0.1 or something. Now, these future experiments are supposed to go down to 10 to the minus 3. So you are actually trying to measure a, 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 a temperature on the sky, which is now of the order of nano Kelvin. Now, the sensors can certainly do that. The, there are sensors that can do that. Question is, can you actually clean your foreground in the galaxy to that level of precision? Right. Uh, so... I'm not, uh, well, uh, we looked at it at the time of the Bicep Saga and we discovered that actually there are uh, imprints of the radio sky on the so-called CMB maps, which means that they have not been cleaned to that level. Now, hopefully uh, this will be uh, uh, overcome in for CMB S4 and other experiments by having many channels and uh, you know they can ask for something that is just a Planck spectrum and nothing else. Then you have to hope that there is no dust component in the galaxy that doesn't also give you a Planck-like spectrum over a limited frequency range. There could be something called magnetized dust that could in principle do that. But even if they succeed, they detect a gravitational wave background. Uh, what you are asking for would then be uh, looking for a one part in a thousand effect in that. So the dipole is a one part in a thousand effect, as Dominic explained, right? So that means you have to go down, not just to the nano K level, but to the pico K level. Now, I'm uh, uh, not sure that you can actually even measure that, but I'm not a CMB expert. Uh, maybe Dominic would like to say. Oh, you are so, you are so much... I mean, all the nano K level in the CMB is already way below the foregrounds, right? So you yes. really have to understand the foregrounds to one part in a thousand, basically. Yeah. You're able to dig out this, uh, this, this. I mean, you can only, I guess, you will only be able to dig them out statistically. Yes. Not, not really individually, right? And And then... The dipole is an individual signal, not a statistical signal. At least a kinematic one, right? So, yes, uh, but you know, uh, there is always room for surprises. I don't know. The gravitational wave community is now growing so rapidly and attracting so many people to it, and people are coming up with new ideas all the time. Uh, you know, I think one can be hopeful that uh, they, they might come up with some smart things to do. But right now, uh, you have to dream about these things. Uh, I don't. I think. I think our immediate efforts are better focused on what is easier to measure, which are like the backgrounds and uh, like X-ray background, X-ray clusters, quasars, radio sources from the ground. This is what is feasible to me. Look, uh, I'm, I mean, some of you are very young people. I'm not so young. I, I, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to see missions which are 50 years in the future. I'm only interested in what I'm going to see 10 years from now. 
and i hope that will be square kilometer array i hope that will be uh, you know lsst right i hope that will be euclid uh, these are things that are happening and of course there is a lot of data amassed by this all sky service so dominic earlier commented that why sees a lot of things that's perfectly true we had to get this 1 and 1/2 million down from 643 million initially right it's a huge cut because you have to get rid of all the foreground sources which are not what we are looking for and there is always going to be some contamination so that is where the skill comes in in trying to make cuts which remove 99% of the contamination but still leaves you enough statistics to work with and uh, you know we have done courtesy of our uh, astronomer colleagues in the collaboration nathan secret uh, and others uh, we have done the best we can right and uh, we are hoping others will follow us and do better studies with more statistics but the first thing is to become aware that this is an important question and uh, uh, that is really what I'm, i'm very happy that we had the opportunity to debate this because i don't think most people in the cosmology community are even uh, that much aware of how important this question is thanks next question uh, i see a raised hand by pavel yeah thank you uh, it was really a pleasure listening to this um, and i i have the following uh, well question um as i understand it um uh, the uh, fluctuations in the cmb which is at the range of a thousand give us the initial conditions and the current understanding and uh, then we observe the um, fairly local density in uh, matter uh, the uh, density field of the matter distribution um and we've just heard some pretty impressive um um results uh, which indicate that there are very much larger density fluctuations than currently thought um on scales of which seem to um surpass the gigaparsec scale and um and my question is with which physics would one get from the uh, redshift 1000 initial conditions to the observed matter distribution which seem to uh, be uh, much larger than currently thought um as far as i know the current uh, law, law of gravity would not be able to do that even with the help of dark matter uh, sorry this this data i don't know if you're referring to this plot i showed earlier the measurement has been made only to redshift a 0.06 so that's about 300 megaparsecs this is uh, not actual there's no actual data there the measurement is made been made up to shapely <laughs> and we need a large object if it is at shapely in order to uh, pull us with the observed velocity yes so, but um, we don't we don't actually know there could be a dipole repeller so tally and others have pointed out that it's not just you need a block to pull us if there is a gap behind us that can push you as well yeah but um, we just heard from dominic that there uh, is in uh, evidence that there is um, a much larger scale um, and in homogeneity right so the matter dipole distribution i mean it's not doesn't seem to be completely certain yet but this indication and uh, we know from the local 300 well local gigaparsec scales the, uh, the kbc void indran albanik mentioned this on the chat um that the under density on the scale of uh, about a gigaparsec is something like 50% which is massively incompatible with the lambda cdm model oh yeah you're talking about the local void yes sure yeah well, that 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 is not something you would expect in lambda cdm where as you quite rightly point out uh, we can calculate assuming usual uh, formalism what the chances of seeing an under density are i don't have the plot here but it's similar you would not expect such a large void exactly so and combined with the hubble tension the um, falsification of the lambda C- cdm model surpasses the seven sigma confidence level so um the uh, but, but i've just heard evidence from dominic that there seems to be even larger scale in homogeneity uh, and I, I, i it seems to me that there's no way of getting from uh, the redshift a uh, thousand uh, boundary condition to the current z re- redshift of zero boundary condition with any known uh, law of physics um so uh, dominic what did you say about the homogeneity on large scale yeah i i mentioned um i mean in principle one explanation could be that i mean this is a gigaparsec sized object but then it's not in order one perturbation right then it would be in order 
1% perturbation, which is still right. much larger than what lambda cold dark matter would predict. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. You are proposing a hypothesis which could account for this. Yeah, that's not something we have actually measured. Yeah, that's so a possibility. Yeah. So with which physics do we get from redshift of a thousand, assuming the CMD is that correct boundary condition, a hot big bang, a cold or photosphere uh, to the current redshift, right? What's the physics? It can't be in Newton. You're saying that uh, the fluctuations that we, small fluctuations that we do observe in the CMB could not have grown to give a structure as big as the one that uh, Dominic is postulating could be responsible for uh, this innovation. Uh, which, which, which we even see in the local gigapassive voids. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so uh, that's ruled out of Newton. Uh, well, it's a matter of what p-value you are prepared to accept, because if you're in a Gaussian random field, anything can happen, right? So uh, you, uh, the point is that I said earlier that the probability of our being in a locality where we see, for example, a bulk flow as large as that is less than 1%. So if you are a lambda CDM fanatic, you would say, oh, sure, we can have as large a void as you like if you allow me to be 0.001% likely or 0.0001% likely. So we have to then decide on what is our threshold for how unlikely we are prepared to accept we are, right? So because anything unlikely can happen. It is tiny vanishing probability. So at some point, we won't believe in any, that anymore. And we will, as you are saying, uh, ask to see some new physics explanation. Right. The question is, have you got there? There's another raised hand by Rudin. Sorry? Thank you. There's another question by Rudin. Please. Hello. Hi, hi Subir. This is Rudin. Hi. hi. I, I just wanted to ask about the... So you, you showed um, uh, the concept of a tilted observer and you briefly discussed the work by Tsagas. Um, I was wondering, so that when I looked at um, his papers, it seemed it, it seemed that um, uh, what was uh, determining a uh, possible sort of fictitious uh, uh, deceleration parameter was, uh, of course, the the size of the region uh, with bulk flow, uh, the magnitude of the velocity, but then also I think it seemed that it was um, important whether the peculiar velocities were on a whole, as a whole, contracting or expanding. That's right. Whether the flow is converging or diverging, is that yeah. right? That will yeah. determine the sign of the, uh, uh, of the thing and also its magnitude. It's yeah. precisely because those things are so hard to calculate yeah. Uh, because we, nobody has measured these things. We don't really know. <laughs> whether, I mean, the peculiar flow measurements are so rare that it's very hard to be able to tell well, how much is the shear in the flow, etc. Okay. And uh, that is why we can't calculate these. A robust prediction is that you should then see an anisotropy in the direction you're moving. And that's what yeah. we look for. Exactly. Yeah. So I was going to ask precisely this, that it seems that... Um, uh, you seemed to sort of favor the spirit of uh, this uh, possible alternative explanation. But I was going to ask, and maybe you answered already, you know, how, how far are we from maybe testing this particular setup more precisely if we can, um, you know, give, give some more confidence to this particular uh, scenario, which is, after all, the claim is it is, it is, a, very, it is a possible uh, scenario in, in GR. It's, it's not a scenario. This is simply the statement that if we are not in the rest frame, if you are in a bulk flow, and you can simply ask what that would do to luminosity distances or whatever it is that cosmologists yes. measure, and you just get a, a, I mean, this is a covariant calculation. Yes. This is not based on a simulation. Yeah, it's I don't mean, I'm saying this, this, yeah. this sort of thing okay. can happen uh, just by pure GR if, if the velocities are such. Yes, yes. It, it, so what Sagas points out is that if you are in a uh, such a bulk flow, and if you are not aware of it or do not make uh, allowances for it, then you might draw the wrong conclusion as to whether uh, the distant objects that you are viewing are accelerating or decelerating or whatever. Because yeah. everything is uh, should be focused on measurement. What are we actually measuring? We are not measuring Q0, H0, anything. We measure magnitudes. We measure redshifts. Yes. So we have to ask, uh, we are always analyzing these measurements of red shift, magnitude, whatever, assuming we are a certain kind of observer, Yeah. right? 
if we are not really that kind of observer but something else then that obviously has a huge impact on what we infer from these things yeah and so far the implicit assumption that has been made by all cosmologists is that uh, you know we are uh, living in this ideal cosmological principle obeying universe except that it is slightly perturbed and we happen to be uh, not quite at the uh, in the right reference frame but we can just boost to it Uh, by making a local special relativistic transformation. Now, uh, people, for example, David Wiltshire, uh, who is a relativist in uh, New Zealand, uh, has pointed out that actually the differential expansion of space cannot really be fully uh, mapped onto a local special relativistic uh, transformation. Right? Uh, general relativity is more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. now whether that is uh, really the cause of what we are seeing or not uh, i one cannot say one has to do further studies but there are some weird things for example david and his collaborators have noted that the variance of the hubble parameter is minimized in the frame of the local group right so uh, actually david kraljik a previous student of mine and we looked at that and we found that actually that is not so unusual when we look at the dark sky lambda cdm newtonian simulations you can find neighborhoods where uh, you know which look like ours like the milky way and andromeda and local group and so on and uh, uh, indeed the variance is minimized in the local group frame so it's not something that would be particularly extraordinary okay. right nevertheless uh, that was simply to ask whether it can happen at all so the dark sky simulation is a certain size it has got so many particles at certain uh, uh, you know it's is the largest thing that has been done so far but when you are looking at these rare things you are on the tail of a distribution you can't even use uh, standard statistics you have to use something called extreme value statistics okay to be sure that you are not deluding yourself Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, people i don't think everyone realizes this because people talk very freely about how lambda cdm is established uh, to 55 sigma or you know i've heard statements like that made in public but now if you established anything at 55 sigma that would be a more astounding finding than finding uh, the the physics that there people are talking about you can't there is no such thing as 55 sigma okay Uh, but uh, in order to talk about rare events you have to therefore be careful about what statistical procedure you are using to uh, quantify that and what i'm saying is that we are definitely rare observers that is now evident uh, from the peculiar velocity the bulk flow etc cetera, etc cetera. and that already means that we should analyze cosmological data keeping in mind that we are in a bulk flow that we are rare observers that this could bias our interpretation of kinematic observables such as the luminosity distance these are all kinematic okay there is no dynamical evidence for lambda at all it's entirely kinematic in origin okay and the rate, correct way to do that is to do a calculation including general relativistic effects do a covariant calculation and that is the calculation that i showed yeah. right but it is a toy model yes right so we have to go beyond that and people are doing that now so a few people are doing that um, so uh, you know for example uh, asta hanesen who is uh, in uh, 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 working in the group of thomas bookert Uh, in lyon she is now trying to develop a formalism uh, which is fully gr for calculating anisotropies uh, and so on the point of course is that we are still data starved uh, you know we can only handle in the cosmographic expansion we can only handle three or at best four parameters we cannot handle uh, you know she has something of order 50 parameters uh, in the fully uh, relativistic uh, parameterization of uh, uh, the luminosity distance okay whereas we have uh, oops sorry i meant to show uh, actually this thing here so we have only uh, you know the hubble parameter uh, deceleration parameter the jerk parameter and we might uh, uh, allow a angular dependence on the sky for you know two of them that's the maximum we can do okay because otherwise you don't have the statistical power to constrain anything but if you give me a 100 million objects then sure we can then start doing something more uh, you know impressive fully generalistically gr wise correct 
99% of cosmology that has been done is Newtonian. Uh, this, again, is something people don't appreciate. Uh, most simulations that are done are Newtonian. Only very recently, the first GR simulations have begun to be done. And in fact, uh, well, uh, uh, there's a group in Geneva, Ruth Druder's group, uh, and uh, they have done this. And they actually found uh, that, uh, in fact, it, it doesn't make much of a difference, they say, to the statistical effect of inhomogeneities along our past light cone. Uh, uh, the so-called back reaction effects they say are not important, but again, they have done it assuming a typical observer. Uh, I've, I've requested them to redo the exercise for uh, unusual observers such as ourselves, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they will find the same answer. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I don't think Ruth is there anymore, otherwise I would have asked her to comment on that. Uh, can, can I ask uh, also in so within the uh, within the analysis, the toy analysis of, of of Tagas, do you have a sense of how how tuned or not tuned um, the parameters at play need to be in order to change the sign of the um, apparent uh, deceleration parameter? Oh, they are basically they are, they can be of the same order. That's all. That's that's all. Christos is saying they can be of the same order. That depends on precisely on the sign of this is, whether it is enough to reverse uh, something which is negative and make it positive, uh, that would depend on the magnitude of these quantities. He has made some numerical estimates which suggested that uh, the effect was worth taking seriously. But the proof of the pudding is independent of his formalism. If we just look at the raw data and we ask whether it has an anisotropy, the thing comes out and uh, socks us in the face. I mean, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is not tuning. This is what we are actually seeing on the sky. And when we analyze the uh, supernova data uh, without making any fancy corrections for uh, CMB frame and peculiar velocities, this is what we see. And the fact that the uh, acceleration inferred from supernovae is a dipole or is anisotropic, it could have further multiples, of course, that is evident when you allow for the angular dependence. Nobody has done that before. And in fact, our work has been confirmed by the people who wrote a paper claiming that we are wrong. They actually recovered our result. Observe this, dipole, monopole. Dipole is minus, they say minus 10. For us, it was something like minus 8.25. And their monopole is something like minus point, whatever it is, three. That's roughly the same as what we had, okay? So, in fact, you see, this is C19. This is Colin 19. This is our paper. The heliocentric redshifts uh, and no covariance. In other words, no correction for peculiar velocities. This is what they recover. They get the same answer. And then they say, oh, hang on. This is not the right answer because this is done in heliocentric uh, 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 redshifts. We really should be using CMB redshifts. So let me go to the CMB. Then I get to this blue patch. So you see the sign of the dipole has just reversed. It's gone from minus 10 to plus six or something. That's simply because uh, uh, the motion of the Earth, uh, of the solar system rather, around the galaxy is in the opposite direction to the CAB. I showed you that picture, right? So uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I was rather taken aback by the fact that Mr. Lubos Mottel uh, <laughs> thinks you have neglected the motion of the solar system and we are therefore crackpots. Uh, as I said, we might be crackpots, but we certainly are very aware of the motion of the solar system. In fact, that is the first thing that Dennis Sharma talked to me about when I came to Oxford to do work with him 40 years ago. I'm very aware of it. Yeah. And you. you see, you see, this is how you're moving. So this is actually a cartoon from uh, George Smoot's Nobel lecture. And he, in fact, uh, was very aware of this uh, prediction that had been made by Stuart and Sharma. He quotes it in his article. But if I tell you this paper by Stuart and Sharma has had, I don't know, less than 20 citations since 1967. What does that tell you? Stuber, may I comment here one thing which Please. might be of interest to many people uh, because I just recently stumbled on that. You know, one of the big supernova data sets is this Pantheon compilation. Yes. And one of our Danish colleagues, Steinhardt, yes. and his students, they yes. recently figured out that they made a complete mess with the redshifts in that uh, compilation. 
Yes. Uh, so they completely started to mix CMV frame, heliocentric frame, uh, did kind of weird corrections. Um, and so, so whoever wants to try out anything with the Pantheon data set, don't use the redshifts that are published there. Uh, actually, this, uh, this uh, thing that you're mentioning by Charles Steinhardt, who I know, he's, uh, in fact, uh, Paul's son, he's at the Dark Center in mm -hmm. Copenhagen, and I was next door. Uh, in fact, the, uh, it came out of a discussion uh, that uh, he had with the Mohammed Ramiz, if you can see my screen, uh, who was at that time in Copenhagen and who discovered that, in fact, when you uh, look at the Pantheon catalog and the uh, JLA catalog, there are many supernovae whose redshifts differ between the two catalogs. They're all listed here. And the differences amount to you know hundreds of sigma because these are spectroscopic redshifts. They're very well measured and they should not differ. And in fact, what we point out in this paper is depending on which set of redshifts you take, you get a different value for the local Hubble parameter. That is why our paper is titled, is there really a Hubble tension? Okay, because mm -hmm. that rests on, as you correctly point out, whether these guys have actually uh, done the job properly. And we are pointing out that using two public catalogs, uh, which are, uh, you know, you can look at uh, look at the quoted redshifts and you can check for yourself. In fact, uh, this paper, we have provided uh, the, uh, the actual code uh, here. So you can go to that uh, uh, code on GitHub and you can actually download it and check for yourself precisely what the differences in redshifts are. And Ramiz uh, uh, has provided a Jupyter notebook with which you can do this. And um, in fact, we put that on the archive. Uh, people don't even want to publish it. This is all verifiable stuff, which is uh, based on publicly available data that there is this discrepancy. And in fact, if you do that, you see that the Pantheon redshifts favor H0 of 72, whereas the JLA redshifts favor H0 of 68. And people are going on about the discrepancy with the Planck measurement, that's 67.4. So we don't really see that you can make a case for a tension when your local measurement is actually uncertain to much more than the precision that has been claimed for it. Uh, and as you say, Charles Steinhardt has also done this. Uh, in, in fact, he was, uh, well, I don't want to speak for him, but he was perhaps a little more reticent about stating it as, <laughs> as candidly as I've done. Because, uh, you know, uh, I, I think people should know this. Yeah, because a bachelor student of mine rediscovered this. And then we found out that others have also known. Yeah, so please, please ask your student to go to this website, download that code and check it. And he can verify for himself that everything that we have stated in this paper is true. Uh, which, by the way, this is a paper uh, we have been unable to publish because uh, uh, you know, nobody wants to actually say that uh, there is uh, no uh, strong uh, basis for claiming there is a Hubble tension. Um, so let me take one um, uh, last question. Um, there is a raised hand by Shamik Ghosh. Um, yes. So yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks to both the speakers for a fantastic talk. Uh, I just have uh, one comment and an associated question. So uh, this was actually noted by Dominic in his talk that uh, systematics and seeing and all of these small, small systematic issues which are associated with any large scale structure surveys are going to be more and more important for us to know. So the point is in case of the CMB community, uh, there are like end to end simulations which are done and systematic checks which are done and still at the end of it, uh, like for Planck polarization, if you're aware that there is a lot of residual systematics which was found later on. So one of the things I think going forward is going to be very important for the upcoming um, surveys for large scale structures is going to be to ensure that we precisely understand what the effects of systematics, beam, seeing, all of this are doing to 
our observations and we can reduce them as far as possible and quantify them in our simulations. So moving forward, what has been done with regards to this in terms of the simulations and putting it in the uh, next generation um, uh, surveys which are going to be coming up? Uh, Dominic, why don't you say that with regard to SKA? That might be something specific that... Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, with respect to the radio things, not only SKA, because I think it's also applicable to EM, EMU and, and to LOTS and so on, which... Sorry, what's the other one? EMU, uh, the Emulating Map of the Universe with ASCAP. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. And, and yeah. LOTS yeah, with, yeah. Uh, with LOFAR, low, yeah. low, 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 low meter sky survey. Yeah. I mean, these two surveys will... Um, already give us partial answers uh, before the SKA goes online. Um, but I must say, unfortunately, we are not really doing very well with end-to-end -end simulations. And that the main reason is that uh, a, a really true end-to-end -end simulation for an interferometric survey uh, is strictly speaking impossible. Because when you you if you really want to simulate a complete telescope data stream, you are talking about terabits per second per telescope. Um, and you need a supercompute center to bring this down to a few uh, gigabits per second and then to further reduce this and so on. And you, for instance, with, with LOVA, we are producing a data set per night that is a few hundred terabyte. Um, and so experiments like Planck, they are small data set experiments. This is not a big data set. In, in, and, and it's the same with LSST. Uh, LSST will have a much, much in larger order of magnitudes, larger data stream. And so a true end-to-end -end simulation, strictly speaking, is impossible. So be because you would need compute resources that are a factor 10 larger than the compute resources that go along with your facility. And they are already having access to the top supercompute centers. So there's no way that we can do this. So I think what we have to do is we have to learn which are the essential steps to simulate. And we cannot, so end-to-end -end simulation should not be the holy grail. It should be trying to isolate what are the critical elements and really get a good understanding of the critical elements um, and then do simulations there, of course. Um, so, I mean, maybe you have heard for the SKA, there is now a, uh, a sequence of science data challenges coming up with the SKA. So the next science data challenge will be on uh, analyzing H1 maps. Uh, they are still um, completely idealized. They still don't have a lot of the, the real systematics in. Um, but nevertheless, I think uh, whoever wants to get engaged uh, with these type of things uh, would be a good opportunity to try to join these uh, data challenges uh, to, to test your tools and things like this. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what else can I say? We, we have to, I mean, you, you know that we also live in times where we have a crisis due to climate change. And so we should not easily say we have to spend uh, 10 times the amount of compute time to understand something better. We have to first spend 10 times the amount of brain power and then, <laughs> and then think what we really compute, I would say. Uh, and uh, maybe it might be good to actually have uh, more investigation into the systematics, residual systematics, which are present in current generation data sets and maybe learn from that as much as we can before we go ahead. And also maybe another good idea for statistical isotropy tests with for cosmology in general 
is not just to do it with one data set or two data sets, but to try and use as many as we can and put all of these together and put joint constraints, which I think for statistical isotropy is kind of lacking for individual problems which have been dealt in CMB or classical structures, but not done jointly very much. Well, you know the problem of trying to combine covariances from different experiments. So that, that is why it is so difficult to do in practice what you're saying in principle. And in particular, the systematics that affect large scale structure are quite different from the ones that you are familiar with in the CMB. Uh, there's also the mismatch of the sizes of the data sets as Dominic commented. Uh, and to be honest, so far I have not seen uh, too many examples where there would be significant benefit from combining data sets. People, of course, do that uh, when they have lack of data. There is no shortage for more data. That's what we need, right? Now, in many things in cosmology, we are data challenged. People don't always realize this. So, for example, a very simple way to establish whether or not there really is a cosmological constant is to look for its negative pressure. That is the late integrated sachs sulf effect. Now, uh, it was pointed out quite a num number of years ago, I think in a nice little paper by Nyaya Shavshoddi, that to see the late ISW effect at five sigma, you need 10 million spectroscopic redshifts, okay? You cannot do with less than that. This is in the cross-correlation study with the CMB. Now, nobody has 10 million redshifts. So far, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe you have a one and a half million, even to date, right? But did, that didn't stop people from putting out any number of uh, results claiming to have seen the late ISW effect with substandard data sets. They are all below two sigma, three sigma, and then it is the job of some poor postdoc to try to combine all of these very different covariances and to try to push it up to five sigma, right? It's just, uh, you know, there is no alternative to getting 10 million redshifts. And the same comment I could make with regard to the baryon acoustic oscillation peak. To do that job properly, to see that peak at five sigma, remember you're looking for a tiny effect, you need five to six million redshifts. Now, that is actually doable in the near future. We will see that with the DAISY survey and uh, subsequent, I mean, spectroscopic redshifts, not photometric, right? That's going to happen maybe in another 10 years. But to date, we don't have it. The first paper on the BAO peak was published with 35,000 redshifts of luminous red galaxies. It was not a measurement of the peak. It was the statement that the data are consistent with where the peak should be in the Lambda CDM model, if you look at the paper carefully. And every BO analysis subsequently has used a template, a Lambda CDM template, because the data sets are simply not uh, large enough to act, pick out uh, the signals without a template. But if you really want to believe that things are as they should be, we cannot afford to keep using templates. We have to actually measure them. I mean, when we the Higgs was found at CERN, it was not done using a template. It's a peak. You take more data, it goes up, okay, as you expect. Whereas in the BAO peak, the first data release claimed to see it at three and a half sigma. The next data release, it was below one sigma. Why? Because in a small sample, there is only a you know, few percent chance of actually seeing the peak. It was 10%. So you do the same exercise 10 times, you only see the peak in one of those exercises, but that one you publish. You don't publish the other nine where you don't see it. And, uh, you know, unless you are knowledgeable about these things, you don't realize that this is what is going on. We need more data. I think it is completely untrue to say that we have a flood of data in cosmology. Not yet. We are just getting there. It is coming, and I'm looking forward to it, but you don't have it yet. Sorry, that, sorry for the rant, but I often feel that people should be aware of how much that they accept as having been established as fact is actually a different statement. It is the statement that an assumed model is consistent with the data. Okay, so I think it's a good time to close the session.
But uh, before that, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, on behalf of the audience uh, both speakers for their time and uh, the talks. Both talks were uh, very clear, full of uh, interesting insights. So we have a lot of food for thoughts this weekend. Thank you. Thanks a lot.